Great. I think we are there. And so uh, hello everyone. I think we are now live. Uh, we are global and this week I'm very glad that we have our own uh, Professor uh, Arvin Sirinavasan uh, with I mean, several awards, several recognitions that we will talk about the awards and other things that, I mean, the other recognition that we had it later and we talk about the details of that. Uh, but uh, before that, I think uh, it is a, a good time to uh, talk about I mean, something that's going on uh, in the last, I don't know, eight minute, eight days in Iran. And this is, I think, of course, the this, uh, hashtag uh, uh, Mahsa Amini. So uh, Mahsa is actually the very familiar with name for me. I have two daughters, of course, that is <laughs> one thing. But Mahsa actually was the name of uh, great PhD students that I had it until recently for five, five and a half hours. And she's now an assistant professor at uh, Northeastern. And uh, for me, like, uh, Masa is like a very familiar thing. And this happened to her, like, she came from a, I mean, different city uh, just because of some thing, I don't know, some hair was out of a scarf, and then she was dead in two hours. That seems, I mean, insane to me. And also, I mean, I have actually this uh, black <laughs> uh, shirt, and I didn't shave actually this time, but this is the way that, in Iran, if there are, I mean, some of your family members or friends essentially pass away, you will go to the event. This is like some kind of way of saying condolences. And of course, condolences that goes to her family and other people that have been killed in the past, like, few days. And like, I can't say that, I mean, uh, this is like, if you believe in God, if you believe in uh, humanity, or if you believe in anything, that's not the way to treat your people. And uh, so this is something that I have been, in, like when I was a child, I think that was like back in 30 years ago. It, these are some of the things that the people may not remember. There were some of these clashes in 1999, but this one even was before. It was, I was born in Gazvin. This was a small city, I mean, not small, but they want to actually be a state. And then, the government didn't approve to be a state. And there was some clashes there. There was a person actually that I was playing, uh, I mean, sometime table tennis uh, with him in uh, some table tennis club. It went and like in a few days, that person essentially didn't appear and we understood actually that has been killed in some of clashes at that time. And, uh, or like uh, this events that are happening, essentially happening, unfortunately, in several times, and the people are passing away because of this. It, it is very sad. I mean, I'm, so I have been probably spent now the second part of my life in uh, US and, Can and Canada. Still, I mean, I read all the news and it's like every day I have been saddened to hear this news. And yeah. <laughs> And especially, I mean, we talk about, I mean, like women here, I mean, this is the one that I wanted to actually mention it. So this is this uh, breakthrough price that is, uh, it is announced every year. And this is a very big award nowadays, $3 million award. And actually we were saying uh, congratulations to Professor uh, Peter Shore who just got it actually for, for the quantum computation that we talk about. But in the same awards, there is a, mm, Another award, which is called Maria Mirzakhani's award, that they actually have added and they are giving to uh, three uh, women working on math. And I mean, we have, uh, I mean, such a person, and these things happen. Like these are the people that we are very proud of. I mean, the first person who got the Fields Medal, the first woman who got the Fields Medal, actually, was from Iran. And I think Arvin, you were one of the first people actually that you congratulated on me. I mean, that's uh, oh. And this is like the thing that is like, we should be very proud of it. And the thing that is happening is not something that anyone wants to be proud of it. And I think some just last word I wanted to uh, mention uh, uh, to people. I mean, any person who has essentially gone, like it can be like in Iran, of course, or like other places like in Russia, 
Ukraine essentially, or in US essentially in the rampages that happened. If you believe in God, just, I mean, think twice if you want to shot or shoot essentially, I mean, to anyone, because if that person is innocent, if that person just came to demonstrate his or her opinion, and is killed, I don't believe that there is, that any fair God will bring you to paradise if there is a paradise and if you believe in it. If you don't believe in it, I cannot say anything on that. I think that's this last word I wanted to say. Anyone, if hears that, I think that might be important, that think twice. Uh, this is something that you have it, you might be ordered, I mean, have been ordered to you, but think twice to use it. It's uh, not something that you can sleep later easily. Uh, this is introduction. I think we are uh, going uh, to talk with uh, Professor uh, Arvin Sirawasan, as I mentioned, uh, he has uh, several awards like the Gestura Prize and other uh, prizes. And uh, so let's uh, start, uh, I think we want to start to say something, I mean, and then we can go. Sure, Mohammed. So first of all, I'm sorry to hear, of course, I know of the recent events in Iran and my very best wishes to the Iranian people of whom, uh, you know, I've had the wonderful opportunity of meeting many in North America, including yourself very warm, uh, you know, cultured and friendly and uh, often very scholarly people. My very best wishes to the Iranian people. And uh, Mohammed, thank you for doing this. I mean, it, it takes really a lot of your time. And, uh, I, you know, I, uh, you know I, and also hello to everybody who's attending this event or watching it later. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks again. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks again. And I hope that, I mean, like next time, I mean, we talk with you or others, we talk about good news from Iran, not such kind of uh, bad news that is, I mean, I think nobody should be proud of such kind of things. Uh, great. So I think uh, let's start uh, um, uh, live and go essentially uh, like when you were a child. I think this is a part of it that we talk about the life. And I mentioned I mean, some of this actually my own experiences with some kind of clashes or other things that happened in Iran very early on, I think, like more than 30 years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, so... Uh, with that, I mean, do you want to I mean, talk a little bit about childhood? I mean, how was your uh, family? And uh, yeah, I was reading actually one interesting thing in the news recently that like lots of professors that like like a good fraction, I don't remember the exact fraction, but lots of these professors actually, one of their parents or the people actually got the PhD, one of their parents was also had a PhD and this is like important. So you are a professor here, what about your family? Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I'll both mention my immediate family and, you know, some others who are not uh, professors, actually were professors, but also PhDs and so on. So, uh, yeah, I was born in 1968 in, um, in the city that's uh, now called Chennai in India. It's, it's one of the large cities of India. It's on the southeastern coast. Previously, it used to be called Madras, which was a British uh, name for it. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, we... <laughs> When I was initially growing up, we were a family of eight. My paternal grandparents were with us, and then my uh, two older sisters and my elder brother, along with my parents. So it was eight of us in a tiny house. Um, uh, my siblings are 13, 12, and uh, nine years older than me. Uh, I, uh, you know, our memories of the past are, you know, sometimes they're not, uh, you know, 100% accurate, but my distinct recollection is of uh, generally very happy childhood. We didn't have that much money. Uh, but I thought life was actually a lot of fun. I mean, my uh, my siblings being much older than me, they, they were almost like parents to me and they took they took significant time taking care of me and showing me tough love uh, wherever it, it was needed. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was just a regular young person's life of just playing with your uh, friends most of the time and having fun. And uh, of course, there was a lot of emphasis at home on, on uh, studying well for school. We had a you know small library in our house, a tiny, a tiny collection of books, tiny and uh, maybe 300 books maybe. And that was a big value uh, uh, position. We didn't have a TV until 1983. So a lot of time was spent either playing with people or studying for school or reading books or magazines. So I think it was a nice life, um, you know. So uh, yeah, and um, uh, about uh, uh, professors, various people in my family have been at different periods, professors, many uh, PhDs and so on. Um, uh, uh, so, so in fact, my, uh, one of my, the, the 
person from my extended family who probably came first to this to the US was uh, my maternal uncle who came in 1963 to Berkeley to, to do a PhD in material science. He was for a while a professor and, uh, and, and later joined industry. Similarly, my brother was for some time a professor and later joined industry. So my brother went to the same undergrad institution as me, IIT Madras. And like me, he was very interested in math and science, but he, was, he also had even broader interests. And he used to you know, you know, tell me a lot about science and math and teach me a lot of math also. So it was very, very enjoyable. I mean, he was not just very bright, but also an excellent teacher. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. But otherwise it was just a, a, you know, a regular childhood, not very different from most people, just enjoying you know, one's time with one's friends. Uh, I think I was pretty immature in my K through 12 education. Uh, we had some very good teachers in retrospect. I didn't realize that they were very good, dedicated. Only later thinking about it, I understood how dedicated some of them were. And, you know, I, I, most of my time in school was just spent on, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, having fun with my friends, I would say. Great. So um, have you been involved in any math competitions or CS yeah. competition, et cetera? And I think uh, the other thing, maybe you want to go to the undergrad as well. So yes. how was the, you were in IIT, I believe. Yes. So that's, yeah. Yeah, so CS basically, you know, I completed high school in 1985. Until then, there was basically not much CS even in the big cities in India. So uh, I, I, I mean, taught in schools. I, of course, my undergrad degree was in CS. So in terms of competitions, I went for a few in math uh, in my city. Even uh, you know the IMO, for example, I don't even know if it was known then in India. I, I you know I would probably have heard of it. I don't think it was known. And even Putnam, once I joined college, I don't believe Putnam, of course, is U.S. and Canada. But the IMO, I don't believe that uh, any of us trained for the IMO to the best of my understanding then. But later, people in our field like uh, you know Moses Charikar, Rina Panigrahi, Ashish Goel, many of them trained and did well also. But uh, yeah, so yeah, so I, I went for a few competitions and in terms of computer science, really my only exposure was, I remember in like in 10th grade, my brother taught me about flowcharts. For example, he taught me about the infinite series for E and then showed me how to do the flowchart if you want to compute it to for N iterations and some simple stuff like that, right? But when I joined undergrad, I, I joined computer science for the pedestrian reason that, um, you know, I think the people who did very well in the in the entrance exam to the IITs typically joined computer science because it was considered a very exciting up and coming field that we didn't know much about. In fact, my goal was to do something more mathematical or more physics oriented. So I seriously considered doing electrical engineering. I think you did computer engineering, right, at Sharif Mohammed? Yeah, but I think that was the yeah, that I think that was the computer science. I will say lots of this actually. But because I was participating in uh, informatics Olympiad, I would say, I mean, the undergrad, I learned, I mean, minimal from the courses because that's of them actually I knew beforehand. There were some courses that I know, but maybe I don't use them that much. Actually, maybe nowadays I'm using it more, like some of this system stuff and database stuff. But uh, yeah, but that was the thing. So in that sense, I mean, that was the, that was no computer science at that time or just near to end of my, I think, uh, time that I finished my undergrad at that time, actually, the, there was a... When did you finish your undergrad? Uh, so uh, 2000, yeah, 2000, actually, I finished. In 1997 to 2000, I was three years, I was <laughs> undergrad. And then, yeah, mm -hmm. one year I was at master at Waterloo and then three and a half, something like in, uh, at MIT, 2005, I graduated, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, and uh, so I, I joined undergrad for computer science. So we had a great time. Once again, <laughs> I think a lot of learning happened outside the classroom. We had excellent library and computing facilities for those days in India. Truly, I think we were very privileged. But again, I was not uh, that enthusiastic about computer science. I, in fact, was thinking I'll uh, go for a PhD in physics or something. But things sort of really turned for me, changed for me at the end of my third year when I started my undergrad project with my undergrad advisor, Professor Pondrangan, he's a very enthusiastic person, gave us research level papers, you know, I mean, we just dived into, uh, you know, I'd just done, I was very interested in math, but, um, you know, we just dived into the research process. And in fact, we even wrote a couple of uh, papers from my undergrad on, you know, various families of perfect graphs. And more than anything, it gave us confidence that, you know, we could do research. I mean, so I don't think I, I you know, I mean, it was not a systematic introduction to research, but a very exciting introduction where you just dived 
uh, right then. And our advisor was very, very enthusiastic. I worked with, uh, with a fellow student of mine. So that way, you know, I, you know, I, by, by the time I was in my fourth year, I was very clear that I wanted to work in algorithms and perhaps more, more broadly in theoretical computer science. And I was, uh, you know, fortunate to get into Cornell. Uh, yeah, that was my, uh, uh, you know. Sort so of have you applied to other places as well? Oh, yes, I think I applied to maybe seven places or so. I, and I think the play, the universities I got admits to were Cornell, Urbana Champaign, NYU, and Ohio State. If my if I, I see. Right, yeah. So you went to uh, and uh, so uh, and uh, which IIT have you been there? Uh, in my hometown of Midras, IIT Midras. Oh yeah, so, IIT Midras. Yeah. Just, and, and I think you have some honorary degree from them as well. If I, um, like some distinguished. Oh, distinguished uh, alumnus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Distinguished alumni from them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the thing that they. Uh, great. So uh, that's like the things that now we talk actually about uh, undergrad more. Uh, I mean, like we talk about the undergrad, and I think I have been actually in 1999. I have been in. IIT Delhi for some ACM programming competition. So that was my last thing. I think maybe first and last there. And there was some interesting thing is happening. I, I would love actually to go and see whether this like uh, still happening that the people I have were sitting on the train. I have never seen in my life that they are doing that. But uh, anyhow, that's what uh, that's, I mean, of course, India is a nice, very nice country. And is it very great culture as well. Uh, great. So uh, I think we will now uh, continue with the uh, graduate uh, things at Cornell. But before that, I think we are live, we are uh, global. And uh, also one other thing I wanted to add, I have, I mean, I know that the people at, I mean, like the internet in Iran, lots of places shut down, but I think we are saving all of this, such that the people can, uh, I mean, watch essentially later. I learned a lot, hopefully you will learn a lot. And also I have this multi channels exactly because of this issue, because some of these countries, I mean, they are, uh, filtering some of these websites, I don't know, Facebook or others, but I mean, some of them like more LinkedIn or others, I think the people or Instagram, maybe not filtered in others. So that's the reason that we are doing multi-channel such that people at different places, they can uh, watch them. Uh, great. So, and we try to alternate. So some of these questions, we try to make something about life. I mean, some of the experience, I think that might be useful uh, for uh, and people. So I think one thing that I wanted to uh, ask, like essentially we are asking, I think this is important also for the, lots of people, uh, like in terms of parenting, I think uh, you have two children, correct? So yes. and, uh, like I think one of them, I know that, uh, I think you told me that uh, he's doing computer science and I think he's yeah, at, he's at, at College Park, yeah. College yeah, uh, so then, I mean, uh, like how was the parenting? Did you try to, I mean, did you teach him this thing? So how was from your side to your Children, we'll go back to undergrad. Both children, I, I, I've tried to teach, uh, you know, math and computer science and some other areas that I like. But, uh, you know, we generally, my wife and I, we don't push them and we, we encourage them and largely leave it up to them to, you know, to figure out things and come to us more with questions. We, we provide them resources. We, we show to them that they're available for them. But generally speaking, I feel, um, uh, you, know, I, you know, my own approach has been uh, somewhat hands off, but being available and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, just showing to them some interesting things, what the, you know, mentioning the science behind computer science, you know, what, uh, you know, how things have changed between the time I was a kid and, you know, what's available now, what are the promises and worries of technology, all of these things, plus some technical um, material, of course, but I don't think I have, apart from showing them resources, you know, and helping them when they ask for help uh, and generally being available, I don't think we have uh, pushed them academically or career-wise too much. And of course, the main thing, we, the two things I hope, uh, you know, people do are one is to, to do things that, you know, they're very good at and they enjoy doing, but also be careful about ensuring that, you know, they can have, a, you know, an independent career ahead, basically. So... I mean, if you balance the two, I, I hope, uh, you know, I, I think most of us do well with that in terms of doing some things we enjoy that hopefully adds value to the world and where we can have our own independent, uh, you know, career and living out of it, basically. So uh, that's been our approach, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, like which year in undergrad is he now? Well, he completed and he works in industry. He completed last year, yeah. Oh, and he went to industry. So that's like the interesting thing. So maybe yeah, come back industry, later. Yeah, sorry? So maybe, like, does he have any intention to come back to become professor or like he's happy at industry? 
I think he he likes industry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah daughter is in 12th grade and she's interested in being a researcher. Uh, yeah. She's also interested in math and computer science. So, so we'll see how things go. Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah, I think we will talk actually. I think we both have been actually at the industry quite a bit. So we will talk the industry in some sense. Uh, like that's the thing that happened essentially to so, so both of us. Of the, you know, in the, in the spirit of it, this not being something like an interview, but a conversation, I know that you're, uh, you know, you have three children and you, your first child, I believe, you know, he's like just nine years old, but I think he's very, very advanced in computer science and math. So is that correct? Is he? Your, is that your first child or second? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's my um, son essentially. I mean, uh, that's. Uh, I mean, I mentioned actually in some of his live about him. I think I want that. I mean, he will be ready. I probably talk with him maybe in some of his lives. But uh, I, I mean, I, I try to encourage him. I think like I started uh, to do it uh, like more uh, math when he was like six years old. And, I mean, and it was like programming and stuff, but I mentioned on some of these lives that I mean, I started actually with Excel. I first started it with Python. Python was not the best one because it had the black things. And I think like, uh, but then I started, I have just started uh, Excel and then some kind of visual basic actually, writing some game with him there essentially. And the, in, the good thing about Excel is like uh, white. The people can see what's happening there. And uh, this, if you add in Visual Basic, actually, this is a big array that you can just put anything there. So we can actually write some kind of, I mean, game that I have uh, written it, I think. Uh, was it uh, Otello or some other thing that I, I mean, and then he became actually interested on, in, and he could do this thing. And then uh, if you work with Visual Basic and then work with Python, then you will actually appreciate a lot Python because it gives you so much things much easier than Visual Basic and the errors are much less and then she, when he went, actually liked it quite a bit. So he's actually, yeah, learning. I tried to also, I mean, I was talking with some of these people in, I was in this ICM, ICPC uh, competition this year at uh, Orlando. And I was talking with some of the people and it was actually interesting. It's mentioned that nowadays, even if you want to do it uh, like a computer Olympiad or informatics Olympiad, one thing that the people are doing, like especially like people from China, etc., these are the people that are just doing math essentially all the way. And then very last moment, like the last two years, they will come back actually and do uh, learning programming and do that. So I actually try to do that. I try to provide more math stuff essentially for him. I mean, he was interested in math, of course. He was going to this, I mean, this class is called Russian math. It's a, uh -huh. it's a Russian style classes. Actually, they are in the US, are very popular. It's becoming quite popular in the US, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they become actually very popular. And it's actually, that's a nice one because that was actually, it was very helpful because I couldn't uh, teach him the variables to him uh, in Python or programming. They were the first that they actually showed him by, the variable was a watermelon that you try to find the weight of that. That's actually very good style of things. And I think actually, that's the one that, uh, but I, I think he's now uh, doing, uh, reading lots of material. I try to just find the books. I think that was for me when I was a child, for me, getting the books was very hard. I mean, yes, that, I mean. as I mentioned, I was in a small city, like a smaller city in Gazin, but like two hours from Tehran. And even getting the books, I mean, they were expensive, of course. Some of them, if you were lucky, you could get a copy of them, like the maybe things but it uh, is like cheaper but it still it was hard to find and so that's the thing that i try to provide such that hopefully he can just uh, find it and i think from this live also i learned from the people that i should let him actually do that i think that should be the case i'm doing also this one with phd students try to i mean i think they should do that we will uh, talk about uh, this as well so like essentially it, and we can actually talk about phd advising now if you want <laughs> then we can go to the other things because this is we will mix essentially research and life and experience, I think, together, such that it is not uh, very boring at some point. I mean, they are, they are interesting. Research even is interesting. But for the people maybe not in the field, I think that might be some more general topics also interesting. So do you want to talk about, I think you had great uh, PhD students, some actually are faculty at UMD, and do you want to talk about a style of PhD, I mean, advising, and whether it has been changed during the years. I think we were talking with Professor David Carger, and he mentioned that actually, yeah, it has changed actually during this time. But yeah, what about your experience on that? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So, but first, maybe I should mention my PhD advisor, David Schmois, who I believe was an outstanding advisor. So with me, he was, you know, I mean, we would meet him every week, but, you know, he, I, I, I was, uh, you know, very passionate and, uh, you know, I would say self-motivated during my PhD. I really enjoyed, 
And it's just understanding reading papers, thinking about them. I, uh, you know, almost every waking hour, I think I was trying to, you know, think about, you know, research. So, uh, so, so I think he understood that and he basically left me free. I mean, I, I, we talked to him every week and stuff, but, uh, but really he gave me full latitude to define my own problems. And, you know, I mean, you know, he was always there to guide, but um, there was substantial freedom. And I, I remember him saying something sometime later, which is, that every student is different and that you know we have to you know you know largely adapt to them and that's something i've also come to understand you know my, my own general personality is to is to make sure people have enough freedom to pursue what they like because you come to do a phd not to you know kind of to do a job for somebody but to advance knowledge you know learn some things do some cool stuff discover things independently right so i think the the quicker we can bring them to the research fr frontier that's a good idea so my general uh, inclination is to is to um, uh, is to give them freedom, uh, uh, you know, in picking their problems and so on. But I like to interact with them closely, and certainly at least once a week, uh, you know. Or, yes, and like uh, David Carger said, you mentioned. Yes, my my style has also changed. I I first try to understand the student better, you know, what their own long term goals are and how I can uh, sort of support them with their long term goals. And really, what David, my advisor, told me. I think is very right, which is that students are very different. They all come with, you know, a strong background and a passion to learn and so on. But, you know, what motivates them, you know, you know, for example, some of them are very open to, you know, constructive criticism. Uh, you know, I can tell them when they really think about it and, and they accept it if, if, if um, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if they believe it works for them. With some others, I, I, I quickly come to understand that the best way for them to learn would be, you know, not too much, uh, you know, input from me, but making their own mistakes and learning. So really, students are very different. You, you're right, and um, and uh, David was right, and uh, yeah. So my exp my goal has been to first try to understand them and to see how I can support their, you know, both their short term advancement through the PhD program, but hopefully also their long term uh, career. So in fact, the the famous uh, mathematician Israel Gelfand once said that calling somebody your former student is like calling somebody your former child. That can never be the case, right? So your child can never be your former child. So, so he thought of you know the student advisor or more generally the student teacher relationship as a lifelong uh, relationship. And some of my students are still very close to me, my graduated students, and I'm delighted to to share their company. And I hope uh, you know, and I also. You know, try to teach and uh, try to keep in touch with some of my teachers and so on. Uh, unfortunately, I've lost contact with my you know K through twelve teachers, although I came in contact with one of them. But I think that this sort of relationship that also evolves over time is is, uh, is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that was a long answer, Mohammed. I'm you know excuse me, but uh, yeah, I I think I've benefited from the student teacher relationship greatly from my teachers as well as from my students. Yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, thanks. I see this. Uh, this was a very nice uh, statement because I have exactly the same feeling. I think I, almost, almost all PhD students and even postdoc that I had it still I try to. I mean, I mean, I'm in contact. I think like the, I even send an email. How is it going at your side? I think. Uh, I mean, that's it was interesting. Some of them actually, but I was in industry, and then I went to some companies and they tried to. I mean help them even to enter that company. So that was actually, I would say, is a continued relation. And I, I think that was exactly the thing that you mentioned. That is, this concept of, I always say to write something like my ex-student, is this a correct thing or a student? I mean, what's the meaning of ex-student? Because I think this is like, as I, you mentioned, this is like having your child essentially, that person, especially you're working for four or five years. And like, I'm very, I mean, like, uh, easy to access like we are talking over phone like sometimes like midnight i don't call them after nine i will always say that call me after nine if you are awake but i don't call you after nine but uh, yeah i think that is it completely like it's like your children and that's the way actually that i love academia because i enjoyed actually working with uh, people and uh, learning so uh, yeah uh, that's uh, great i think we talk about uh, david shimo is here and we will hopefully have him also sometime in the uh, future but uh, like uh, and 
you actually worked on the techniques for probabilistic analysis and randomness efficient computation. Was it the, uh, was it the main area that uh, David was working on it? Or I think that was, it seems a little bit, I mean, maybe different from the, his optimization background than others. Yeah, and yeah. I think you can talk about your thesis and then we will go from there. Yeah, it's very interesting. So David's primary interests then were combinatorial optimization and approximation <laughs> algorithms. He had also done distributed computing in the 1980s, <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? Like I said, I, it was really a manifest manifestation of him really giving much freedom to his students and certainly to me to explore what I liked. Actually, I was fortunate. So, you know, uh, in, during my undergrad research in my last semester as an undergrad, my advisor showed us a paper of Rajasekharan and Reif that used, um, um, uh, you know, identity testing, probabilistic identity testing, for example, testing if a black box polynomial is identically zero for some problem. And that fascinated me. And when I came to Cornell first, Vijay Vazirani taught us a class on randomness and computation. He was there for a year. That was outstanding. Also, I got, uh, you know, you, you very well know the randomized algorithms book of Motwani and Raghavan. It was initially available as a draft by Prabhakar Raghavan. I had written to Prabhakar and he had kindly shared those notes. And all of those were very, very uh, exciting resources to, to study randomization uh, myself. And also the Alone Spencer book was out, I think in 1992 or so. Uh, before that, you know, Joel Spencer had the book, 10 lectures on the probabilistic method. So through all of these resources and by talking with my colleagues, especially with my uh, fellow student, Alessandro Pankunesi, who was a close friend. You know, a lot of us got very excited about these. My thesis was primarily on randomization uh, applied to a few areas. One was distributed algorithms. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, essentially, as you know, you know, the future is going to be, for example, let's say a lot of tiny sensors in our household appliances, in a car, you know, that are all talking to each other, right? For example, with self-driving cars, you know, the general vision is that, in fact, you can use roads very efficiently because right now, let's say that cars need a certain amount of distance on the, on the highway, let's say in the US to be safe because if cars are driving at 60 or 65 miles per hour, you know, breaking time, you need that much interval, right? But if, if you once have self-driving cars and they can coordinate among each other, then this car that's in front, if it's going to break, you know, it can very quickly send a message to the cars around it, right? And then they can anticipate it, they can break in advance, so you can use the road very efficiently and the gaps need not be much and so on, right? So what is the, the sort of communication and computational technology behind this? You have some, some devices that can do some simple computations and they primarily communicate with each other, right? So this is a general model of distributed computing. The specific thing I mentioned is, you know, maybe an example of what is called the internet of things. But in general, you may have, uh, you know, entities on the cloud that are communicating with each other or entities embedded in the real world, like in uh, uh, the, like sensors that communicate with each other. And randomization using randomness uh, is a very natural uh, way, for example, to do what is called contention resolution. So, for example, if you if if a whole bunch of us with our uh, you know are trying to use the same Wi-Fi network, and let's say fifty of us converge to a room, right, and the wireless access point has to support the communication from all of us, right, and it's a very dynamic network in the sense some people come in, some people go out. There is no way the access point can do round robin among us. For example, tell person number one, you communicate first, then this, then this person, then this person, and so on. We all try to communicate distributedly without knowing anything about each other and our communication patterns. And you know, the system, the, the network protocol needs to have some contention resolution mechanism, right? There is a simple protocol, a classic ethernet protocol called binary exponential backoff, for example, right? So where, for instance, your device in the protocol, if it has tried I times and failed to fail to use the, 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 the bandwidth in the, in the, in the Wi-Fi network because too many devices are trying to use it at the same time, if I've tried I equal to five times, I will back off with probability two to the minus I or something, uh, one minus two to the minus I before trying next. In other words, you know, without knowing anything about how many other people are in the system you know, that are trying to share a common resource, in, in this case, the bandwidth in the particular room, right? Just based on my record of how many times I failed to access the resource, 
I, the system gives me a back off probability with which I back off before trying to send my message again, right? This is a classic example of distributed contention resolution. And I think that is also just added, I think this is very related to uh, TCP IP type of thing. These are like the, I think the multiplicative, uh, like uh, additive additions and multiplicative, I mean, like additive increase, increase and uh, multiplicative decrease. That's also a beautiful thing. And I think you can actually have the randomization version of that as well. Yes. So, so yeah. So, so basically, randomization turns out to be a very powerful idea, useful idea in distributed algorithms, <laughs> as well as, of course, with many other you know forms of uh, you know computational models and communication models. So, part of my thesis was on that. Part of my thesis was in this really beautiful area called de-randomization and pseudo-randomness, where on you know you take the complementary view, which is, do we really need randomization? If not. Can we at least, uh, if we still do, can we at least reduce the number of random bits we need? Or alternatively, can we work with low quality random bits, poor quality random bits? Because as you know, in the real world, our uh, operating systems give us uh, what are called pseudo random bits, not real random bits that are uh, assumed in the ideal sense by a randomized algorithm. So, my, my, so, so uh, this general area of de-randomization talks about how, how much you can limit your requirement of, of randomness. And in fact, it's now closely connected to cryptography, computational complexity. <coughs> so part of my thesis was on that. There again, although one says de-randomization, probabilistic thinking is, is very important because one way of doing de-randomization is to develop a randomized algorithm whose need for randomness is so little. For example, let's say you cut your ran the randomness requirement of your algorithm to let's say 15 bits, right? Then the number of possible 15 bit sequences is only two to the 15, right? So that's like uh, 32,000 or something. So then you can just, uh, you know, cycle over, you can separately run over all those 32,000 possibilities to obtain a deterministic algorithm, right? So although one says de randomization, pseudo randomness, et cetera, probabilistic thinking is required for both randomized algorithms and de randomization. And, uh, you know, the, um, uh, all the resources that I benefited from uh, studying from were, were very helpful in sort of uh, writing this thesis. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, actually, I mean, I just want to refer to some other previous live that we had is, is Professor David Carger. We talked actually about Professor, late Professor uh, Mutwani and uh, some, I mean, uh, memories of uh, him. That was, I mean, and this great book that he had. Uh, and also we talked, I mean, with Professor Nogal and about this, yeah, probabilistic method. I think that's a great, very nice book, essentially, that almost mm -hmm. everything that you need to know, I mean, yes. is there. Of course, there are some maybe new theorems, but generally for almost every basic or non-basic stuff are uh, there. So uh, that's uh, uh, great. And also one other thing I think I want to say that about the randomizations, which is uh, quite a bit uh, important, is, uh, I mean, this is this was actually about working on C++ when I was like, or C on C++ when I was, I think I'm like 10 years, maybe maybe 12, 10, 11 years old or something like this. And it, it is interesting so you, that you, I- you 10 years old, you said? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was working on these things essentially. As, as, you know, C++ is the, like I was doing basic, but they didn't write anything basic. But the first language that I had actually written some programs was C++, uh, C and C++. And it was interesting, like, then I went to Google, I think back, uh, I don't know, this, I, I was using essentially, of course, C or Pascal, that I was well, at some point I was doing Pascal, that was good for informatics Olympiad. But uh, later, I think it was in 2016, yeah, end of 2016, I went to uh, Google. And then you needed to actually do some programming as well, I mean, visiting there, it was good. And then it was again C++. And that was the first thing that the people mentioned to me was about mapping. So this is, if you work, I mean, C++, there is something like a TSL. Uh, this is like the uh, STL or TSL. <laughs> Forgive me if I... Wrong, you know. Also, this uh, event that I'm reading every day <laughs> that also had something. Uh, I mean, especially today. Excuse me if I not maybe not the in the sharpest mode because of all this news, uh, bad news from Iran. But uh, yes, uh, but uh, I wanted to. Uh, so so this uh, like there are some new things that C plus plus eleven. I believe they have added uh, that now. This is the packages that in one of important one is the mapping. This mapping essentially is you are using randomness essentially and hashing, and it is somehow embedded in C++, so you are using it. 
And of course, some other languages like Python and others, they have the data. And these are all based in this randomization, like hashing without, this is the one of the most basic things that use uh, randomization essentially, such that you can have arbitrary indices, but still the size that you need to keep all this would be a small. So that's like, is, in some sense now, it's not just something that you are doing it, uh, you use random or random instances in your program, it is already there. Whenever you are using mapping or dictionary, you are using randomization in any language. And that was quite interesting. Like C++ has added such kind of things as the basic stuff as mentioned. So yeah, so randomization is an important one. And uh, I think you guys also PhD during the time that I think, uh, I think uh, David Carger and uh, Madhusudan, they got it, I think it was, they had this 1993, you got it also your PhD. Uh, I think Sudan was 92 and Kargar was 94. Yeah, yeah so you were in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, David right Williamson much. was also 93, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is one of the interesting things that we will talk. Uh, uh, I will say maybe approximation algorithm I mean, was a hot topic, maybe less, a bit less now, essentially. In some sense, there is everything approximation, but not the traditional approximation algorithms or combinatorial optimization. But if we are talking about 1992 about randomization and still randomization is a very huge thing now. And I think we will talk a little bit about industry. I think uh, here, I mean, of course you have been at Bell Labs and then more recently you have been at, uh, an Amazon scholar at uh, AWS. And I'm working actually at AWS, I mean, for some of the system stuff, it's actually great these cloud things. And I think if you can, I mean, to the extent that you can talk about like, how can we use randomizations for there, then we will talk about the uh, other researchers and other stuff, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, without going into specific details of what uh, I'm doing at Amazon, maybe generally one very interesting topic you mentioned is hashing and, you know, uh, uh, yeah. So, so like Mohammed said, you know, uh, hashing is a classic classical topic dating back at least to the 1960s. <laughs> You know, Knuth and others had already analyzed, you know, various aspects of hashing. And my impression of hashing until, say, the mid-90s, the late 90s, was that it's still a classical topic. But the modern data science and cloud computing and, you know, other era has really changed things. So, for example, you know, consistent hashing came, came along from MIT, in fact, in uh, around uh, 1997. Uh, it is very good in dealing with uh, dynamic uh, data uh, and peer-to-peer -peer networks and so on. And later, locality <laughs> hashing, where you know similar entities, you know where you kind of go against the grain of uh, normal hashing, where you're, you know, the, the ideal for a hash function is like a random function, basically, right? And you want to simulate a random function using few random bits. But it went in the other direction, basically, uh, and uh, you know, so so in locality sensitive hashing, if you have a, a metric on the items that you're uh, hashing, then two items that are close to each other have are more likely to be mapped onto the same hash, uh, you know, hash bucket, while you know items that are far away are, you know, more likely to be hashed to different buckets. Right? This kind of thing again has been extremely helpful in developing sublinear algorithms, detecting, you know, finding duplicates, all of these. The other uh, application of hashing, of course, is in is in data streaming, right? Where again, you know, sort of very interesting, uh, you know, linear sketches and so on, which of course heavily use both the ingredients of randomization and approximation uh, and uh, our sophisticated forms of hashing have, have come to play. So uh, yes, and, and you know, data streams, very fast algorithms, sketching is all, all of this is sort of, is, is a staple in numerous tech companies. So, but in fact, even when I worked in one interesting thing, Mohammed is, so I was at Bell Labs between 1998 and 2001. Yeah. Even then you routinely use, you know, algorithms published in the top <clears throat> algorithms conferences right then, very modern for those days, you know, again, without going into, because some of it is, you know, company confidential kind of thing, but at a very high level, you know, stuff that was happening right then in Stock, Fox and Soda, the top algorithms and theory conferences, some of them we actually implemented and tried to extend and so on, right? <laughs> so that, um, you know, of course, the, the, the area of algorithms is, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, maybe much of the motivation is from foundational theory, but, you know, I mean, routinely perhaps simplified um, or easier to implement versions of all this cutting edge theory is, you know, is directly used in, uh, in industry, uh, you know, hashing, as you pointed out, various ha versions of hashing, which have become very popular uh, and, uh, you know, data sketching, <coughs> sublinear algorithms, 
all of which use randomization and they use approximation as a necessary ingredient in the sense that typically the, the output solution is not exact, but to within a precise definition of uh, notion of approximation. Uh, yeah, thanks. Actually, yeah, this uh, local sensitive uh, hashing that you mentioned, I think that's uh, very interesting or like generally more generally distributed hashing. And I would say actually this might be the case, as I mentioned, there are like a few areas in theory that have been still, I mean, probably the same, I mean, hotness that they were, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and still we are using them a lot. And I think one beautiful thing about the randomized algorithm, and we talk with a few people there, and that is important because in some sense simplifies the algorithm, like the one that you mentioned. Like, for example, I mean, just the, say in general clubs. So you have this data, you want to just make sure that, I mean, the data of these people, like the files that this person has had it, like for example, all or Gmail, Google Drive, etc. all of them are there. And you want to make sure that you cannot have all of them in one computer, but you want to have it generally that they are closed by computers. And if you just think about this one, if you want to solve this one without randomness, you might be able to do some optimization, etc. But that might be quite, I mean, it's time consuming. You need to have online versions of that. And you may have one more conditions and then the optimization does not work anymore. But when you have the randomization, it's like a very simplified algorithm. Almost if you have the right uh, algorithm, and this is important. This is the thing that some of these algorithms that we are talking about, when I was actually at uh, an intern at IBM Watson, I was working with uh, Don Copper Smith. Actually, he was great. Um, one of the smartest people that we have seen actually in the uh, randomization. Uh, and, uh, and Gregory Sorkin, actually, that he was also my mentor, actually. And that's one interesting that they said some of these algorithms, they might be very easy to mention, but if you want to the analysis, it's very complicated. But the good thing is that they are very simple algorithms to implement. And if you have the right, I mean, algorithms, even some condition changes a little bit, does not change the algorithm. Very robust algorithm, very simple algorithm. And of course, they are not uh, trivial at all to do the analysis. And that's the thing that, I mean, the people in theory actually are doing, I think, great favor here, because you need to really understand deep there what is the thing that is going there, and you can uh, use it. And, but I mean, one other thing that I want to say about Arvin, that's also I heard, uh, I didn't sit in his classes, but several of my students, I mean, had it. I mentioned this one about uh, Professor uh, Madhu Sudan as well, that I was sitting in his classes. But I think he's giving actually very great intuitions about the things like hard stuff, make it simple and something that you can get it. I think that's uh, one of the things that I should mention. I heard a lot from a serious and whenever he teaches a course, I said, you should always take the course with uh, uh, Arvind because I think you will get a great uh, understanding about the randomized algorithm. And I think that was one of the things that we had a few people, as I mentioned, the very important topic that you need to know. And this is very useful. And it is, you are already using, if you are doing programming by mapping, dictionary, et cetera. But if you want to design new algorithm, it is important. And I think Arvind is one of the best people actually to explain this and the great thing that you have it. So uh, great. So I think uh, given that, so let me see uh, about the uh, things. Do you want to, I mean, uh, say anything about, I mean, your advisor like uh, David Shimois or the other people you are thankful to them essentially, I think that you may add <laughs> during the life essentially, yeah. Ah, I see so many, so many. The thing is, you know, I, if I start naming people, I, I know I, 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 I would like to name a few people, but um, let me say that it's just a, a small subset of the people I'm, I'm uh, very thankful to. So, you know, uh, you know, from my young age, my, of course, my family, my parents, my siblings, and also, you know, many uncles and aunts who are very encouraging, actually. So, and many, many dedicated teachers and who, like I said, you know, when I was in K through 12, I don't think I had the maturity to understand them well, but later I thought, wow, I mean, these were really dedicated people. Many of my undergrad teachers, certainly my undergrad advisor, Professor Pondrungan, and during grad school, you know, David Schmoyes was a very, very um, motivating person for me. Eva Tardosh, again, very inspirational figure. And, you know, she, she also helped us with some probabilistic analysis on one of our papers. Uh, yeah, so many faculty, many teachers and uh, all my students and colleagues such as you, Mohammed. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> many, uh, you know, uh, many people in our community who have inspired me. I mean, just to, if I can mention a small random subset, 
of, of them, it would certainly include Noga Alon, Joel Spencer, Alan Fries, Eli Apfel, Alistair Sinclair, Yossi Azar, Sefi Naur. Uh, you know, and, you know. Again, I'm I'm leaving out many many people, but uh, let me just say that there's a random subset of the many people who have, who have inspired me, as well as my longtime friend and PhD fellow PhD student Alessandro Panconesi, who, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, with whom I've had a lot of uh, you know delightful times, you know, doing research and generally, you know, talking about life. So yeah, many many people to be thankful for, as well as many institutions. I think. You know, you also need institutions to, you know, to, to, to sort of encourage young people and, you know, the places I studied and then DIMAX, the Institute for Advanced Study, the places I worked at, they all have, you know, have had some very, you know, uh, enlightened senior people and, and management and who knew when to give freedom, when to set uh, goals, when to give directives and, you know, uh, thus making you know, the life of a, of, a, of a junior scientist, very, very uh, fulfilling, basically. So, yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to many of them. Yeah. Uh, great. So, again, again, we are live in multi-platform. If you have a question, please uh, ask, I mean, at uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, or other, uh, uh, or Instagram, or you can always email me. I will check them, and if there are some questions, we will uh, ask. From uh, I mean, Professor uh, Arvin Sirnavasan. So uh, let's go. I mean, actually, to one question about again, we talk about randomness and the importance of that. I'm teaching actually uh, this uh, data science course, and one interesting thing here is that the new view of data science. Lots of the time that we talk about the data science, we have a big data. We have we can consider essentially a big Excel file. That some places you have the data, some you don't have it, and you want to fill in this thing. This is actually some concept that. I was actually written some program to compute this one. And then later on, actually, this is uh, Amazon at the Gluon. I think that's a good one, actually, if you want to do that. And this is more automated version of doing that. So if you consider this one, this is actually uh, interesting things that in the data science, we use to fill in these gaps, essentially. We are using the concept of uh, correlation a lot. Because that's the one, actually, that gives us, if there was somehow these are independent things, this field you have this number doesn't tell you anything about to fill in this gap. So in some sense, correlation instead of causation is the one that I think makes data science, current data science study a big, uh, like, like it's a different field essentially. It's much newer ideas and understanding. And I think you are probably I mean, one of the best people that you want to have asked question about the uh, correlation, in particular both negative and positive correlations. So I think that might be good, I mean, to talk a little bit. Again, we are using that in all of, almost all of these algorithms that you are using in the ML, I don't know, linear regression or other forest or um, XGBoost, other, we are using all of them, of course, in the, even the deepness. But maybe just go a little bit, talk about, uh, so we want sometimes we have the random, uh, like independent variables such that we can, the analysis would be easy. But at the same time, correlation give us something that it is actually very valuable thing, the whole, Data science is based on correlation. So I think, yeah. So I think you want to add something on that and go deeper yes, than yeah. that. So, so classically in information theory, there are notions like the mutual information between two random variables, right? It's basically, you know, uh, you know, the mutual information is always non-negative and it is zero if and only if the two random variables X and Y that you're measuring the mutual information between are independent of each other. Otherwise, and for example, it is largest if, if they're identically the same, et cetera, right? So, but as Mohammed said, you know, you, you're, uh, in general, you're not just interested in whether the two are uh, independent of each other or not, or to what extent they are uh, dependent on each other, right? But also what the direction of the correlation is, whether they're positive or negative. So, Negative. Maybe you want to define the terms as well, essentially. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, actually for negative, there is a very rich theory. And in fact, uh, Nima Anari, who you know very well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mohammed. so his, a lot of his work is on very sophisticated versions of negative dependence. But okay, let's, let's start with the basics of first negative uh, correlation. But first of all, as we know, two random variables, X and Y are independent if, um, uh, if one has nothing to do th with the other. Uh, for instance, if they are both binary random variables, uh, you know, true or false, for example, then the probability that y is true, given that x is true, should simply be the probability that y is true, 
Similarly, the probability that y is true given that x is false should simply be the probability that y is true. In other words, saying something about x does not influence anything about y. Right? No so, implications essentially is going on. Pardon? No implications between no, these. No things. implication connection between the two. Uh, as a simple physical example, if x is the random variable that says uh, whether um, uh, 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 whether a coin toss in New Zealand that's happening now is heads or tails, it's reasonable to hypothesize that if I toss a coin now, not very high up into the air, but just say locally like this, and if y is the outcome of that coin, then y is likely independent of the coin toss in New Zealand. That's a physical example. You can also give more mathematical examples. So independence is something, uh, you know, if you can get, it's great, because then the probability that x equals a and y equals b can be factored into just the product of the two, the probability that x equals a times the probability that y equals b. That's actually the, the definition of independence, that for x and y, they're independent if and only for all a and b, this is true. Right? But of course, in general, we are not lucky to get independence. Just as one example, suppose you, I, I'll give a physical example, but um, uh, you know, simple variants of this are, are, are occur all the time in algorithms and computer science and as also in data science in terms of negative correlation in the following sense. So suppose you keep, so suppose there is, a, uh, there is an urn or a box that contains some red balls and blue balls, right? maybe you know, some number of them, say 100 of them and 70 of the other or whatever, right? And you keep picking balls, but you don't replace them, right? So once I pick, I pick a ball, I, I pick a ball at random, record its color and put it away. I don't put it back. I pick another ball at random, record its color and put it away, right? So suppose the random binary random variable X1 is one if the first ball is red and zero otherwise, right? If it, it is one, if the first ball is red, and zero if the first ball is blue, right? So X1 measures the color of uh, the first ball in the sense that it's the, the so-called indicator random variable for whether the first ball that you picked is red or not, right? Similarly, for the second ball, define X2 to be one if the second ball is red and zero otherwise and so on, right? Now, I claim that informally, you know, we'll define it in a minute, but informally, I claim that these random variables Xi are negatively correlated with each other, right? For example, if I tell you that the first ball and the second ball were both red, right? In other words, if I condition on the event that X1 is one and X2 is one, the probability that X3 is also one should be smaller than the probability that just X3 is equal to one unconditionally, right? right? So this is essentially, this is, okay. So, so let's just start with two random variables. Let's say with binary random variables, X and Y, both taking values zero and one. You can call them negatively correlated if and only if the probability that y is equal to one, given that x is equal to one, is less than or equal to the probability that y equal to one, right? So if one of them is one, it lowers the probability that the other is also one. Similarly, if one of them is zero, similarly, if the first ball is zero, it lowers the probability that second ball is also zero, right? So, so let, let me give a slightly more sophisticated example from computer science. Suppose you have a graph, right? A connected, undirected graph, right? As you know, it has a number of spanning trees. We are not talking about minimum spanning trees, just spanning trees, right? It has some number of spanning trees, right? Suppose you pick a spanning tree at random, uniformly at random from among all possible spanning trees of this graph. Right? And the spanning tree is a set of essentially edges that they don't have any cycle and they are connecting every vertex in the graph. Yes, thank you, yeah. For example, if, if your graph is a cycle, then a spanning tree is obtained by removing any one edge from the graph, right? No cycle, but connecting up all the vertices, right? So it can have a complicated, it need not be a, a something like this. It can have a branching, it'll have a branching structure and so on, right? But uh, as, uh, as the viewers here may well know, if you have a graph on n vertices, every spanning tree has exactly n minus one edges, right? So therefore, now consider your whole graph G, look at an edge E and another edge E prime, right? Now pick a, pick a random spanning tree from the graph. Let X E be one if the edge E is in the spanning, uh, I, I'm sp sorry, in the spanning tree that you constructed and zero otherwise. Similarly, X E prime is one if the edge E prime is in the spanning tree you constructed and zero otherwise, right? Informally, one could think that, you know, these two are negatively correlated, right? Because there is only room for N minus one edges. So if this edge is already present, then the probability that exists should come down. This is in fact true, 
This is in fact true. Uh, so that's a very simple notion of negative correlation between two random variables, right? If you have multiple random variables, like in our, uh, like the multiple edges in your graph or uh, multiple draws of a ball from, from this box, right? You can call them cylinder negatively correlated. If, for example, the probability that any one of them is one, given that some other number of them, any number of them are all equal to one, is less than or equal to the probability that this was equal to one. For example, in our random draw of balls, you could say that x1, x2, x3, etc., are a sequence of random variables with cylinder negatively correlated. If, as one example, the probability that x x5 is one, conditional on x1 is one, x2 is one, x8 is one, x20 is one, etc., is less than or equal to the probability that x5 is one. The conditional probability that one variable is one, given that many of uh, many others, whichever others you pick, are all equal to one, should be less than or equal to the unconditional probability. Yes. Similarly, the probability that one of them is zero, given that any bunch of some num some others are all zero should be less than or equal to the unconditional probability that this variable, for example, x5 is zero. Similarly, you can define this for edges in a, in a random spanning tree as well. So that's a simple notion called negative, uh, uh, cylinder negative correlation. There are even stronger notions of uh, negative uh, association, uh, negative dependence. One is called negative association with some beautiful properties. And maybe the strongest notion, or in a sense, the weakest notion of, uh, you know, something that is, uh, 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 you know, so so uh, as close to independence as um, in our, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the weakest notion of independence is what is called strongly Rayleigh. And that is in fact true of the, the, the random spanning tree uh, random variables. In other words, if you write the random variables, xe1, xe2, x3, xe3, et cetera, they have this very strong notion of negative correlation with a lot of, uh, you know, negative dependence properties called um, strongly Rayleigh. And in fact, this has led to a lot of exciting stuff. It is connected to, uh, closely connected to what, what are called stable polynomials. And that's led to a lot of revolutionary stuff on sampling, sampling matroid bases for those of you who may have seen matroids, which are a sort of uh, abstraction of greedy algorithms. And, and uh, they're also an abstraction of linear independence. Uh, so they combine you know, aspects of linear algebra and algorithms and complexity you know, sampling bases of matroids and stuff, Markov chains on, on these, a lot of the exciting work in the last 10 to 15 years has been based on the strongly Rayleigh distribution. So the theory of negative correlation, random variables that are roughly negatively correlated is well is well developed. In contrast, positive correlation, maybe I'll just give you one example. So suppose there are many, uh, many objects in a, uh, many, let's say gifts in a room, right? That, and maybe many people get, you know, uh, maybe you know a person can get more than one gift, and maybe somebody is deciding stochastically. Maybe for this gift, I'll give to Muhammad, and independently of that, this gift I'll give to Arvin, and this other gift I'll give to this other person, and I may give this same person multiple gifts and so on. And let's say Muhammad is in interested in uh, items number one, three, and five, and I am interested in items uh, three, six, and eight, right? So he's interested in those three, I'm interested in these three, and there is something in common, three. Uh, excuse me, uh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. Let's assume that for now you have multiple copies of a gift, okay? So the same gift tree can go to Muhammad as well as to me. Excuse me, I, I forgot that. So suppose you define some random process on these, and suppose, and because there are multiple copies, suppose somebody tells me that Muhammad is happy. That means that he got all three, uh, that he got all three of one, three, and five, right? And let's also assume that if three is given to one person, it will also be given to every person who wants it, let's say, right? So suppose you have some, some random process like this, right? So in other words, for every gift I, you decide whether to activate it or not. If you activate it, you give it to every person who wanted it, right? But you, you may not activate all the gifts. Variants of this come up in approximation algorithms, for example, group Steiner tree and uh, you know, uh, you know um, covering Steiner tree and so on. Right, so now if I condition on Mohammed being happy, right? So, okay, previous, okay, when will I be happy? I think I was interested in, uh, I forget which items I said, maybe let's say three, four, and I eight. I think three was, yeah, three was the common. Three was the common. So, Mohammed wanted one, three, and five. Let's say I want three, four, and eight. 
a priori, I have a certain probability that I'll be happy, which is the probability that three is activated and four is activated and eight is activated, right? And let's say these are all independent. So it's the, prob the product of these three probabilities is my unconditional probability of being happy, right? But suppose I condition on Mohammed being happy, that means that one has been activated, three has been activated and five has been activated, right? In particular, what is common to both of us, which is three has been activated, then the chance that I am also happy only goes up because I now only need that the remaining items I wanted, which are four and eight also be activated, right? So his happiness and my happiness are positively correlated. In other words, for two random variables, let's say uh, binary random variables, uh, X and Y, uh, or uh, Boolean random variables, X and Y, let's call them positively correlated if the probability that X happens given that Y happens is greater than or equal to the probability that X happens, right? It's the opposite inequality to what we are interested in, uh, in, in negative independence, right? Negative, you wanted less than or equal to, now if one happens, it only makes the other more likely. Or more generally, now you have, can have a sequence of, uh, say, binary random variables, x1, x2, x3, et cetera. What you want is something like the probability that x, uh, x10 is 1, given that x1 is 1, x3 is 1, and x20 is 1, is greater than or equal to the probability that x20 is 1. Uh, this is called positive correlation. So, Mohammed, if you like, I can talk about concentration inequalities and so on, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it up to you about why. Yeah. <laughs> so, let me actually ask a few. I mean, I think there's some intuition that. I think you're great on that one. And uh, so, uh, like, uh, this is the issue, as you mentioned, for actually for negative correlation, we have a lot of discussion, and as I mentioned, actually, one of uh, several of your work are the like the best work in the areas, especially as uh, mentioned. A student, I will refer to you if there is something about negative correlation that we want to discuss. But for positive correlation, there is not much work. So, let me compare that one with optimization, like our approximation algorithm. Generally, we have like a maximization problem is that we want to have solve some optimization problem and the goal is to maximize some quantity under some conditions. This is generally called the maximization problem. A minimization problem is very similar. We want to, again, minimize some quantity under some conditions. And the question when we talk about like approximation or optimization, maximization and minimization, actually they are quite different set of people and they are behave quite differently. I mean, we can, for example, for set cover, there was this uh, problem that is like for minimization, it was like an approximation hard and it was tight. For uh, maximization, there was uh, this uh, uh, coloring, uh, mm, uh, yeah, I think the, the coloring problem that you had it, and I think we had this unique coverage that we had it, that both of them actually, these are seen the first natural algorithm that are like and hard. So uh, at the same time, somebody may ask, like if you consider a negative uh, like minimization problem and uh, maximization problem, they should be not much different because if you put the objective function negative of that, then the maximization becomes <laughs> minimization and vice versa. However, I think the answer to this one is that we are talking generally about maximization and minimization. We talk about the objective functions which are positive. So is this something going on like this for the positive versus negative that we have a I mean, good amount of work for negative correlation, but we don't have that much for positive correlation? I see, I see. Uh, I don't see an immediate connection to this interesting minimization versus maximization um, you know, uh, phenomenon that you mentioned. And as Mohammed said, Indeed, you know, also the approximation thresholds are, as you pointed out, very different for clique and chromatic. For clique, for example, it's it's close to n, uh, but also chromatic number, which is, uh, you know, min minimization problem is n, but typically for uh, minimization problems, the, the, the threshold is, the approximation threshold is a constant or logarithmic often, and maximization problems, it's very hard to find thresholds like log n, and indeed that's what you know, I think the dominating set I mentioned, Mr. Spock, I think the dominate, the you wanted to want the maximum number of dominating set that you can put it, that's <laughs> your problem yeah. essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see a connect, but, but I think it's a very good point about, uh, you know, uh, so, so one reason why positive correlation is difficult to handle is, uh, many of you may know about what are called the Chernoff bounds. The Chernoff bounds are, for example, if you have independent random variables, for instance, if you toss a coin independently uh, a million times, the probability, that, you know, you expect to get 500,000 heads, right? The probability that you get like more than six, 600,000 heads or more than 600,000 tails is extremely small. It's basically zero, right? So 
basically if you have if you aggregate many functions not even add them necessarily but if you aggregate them so that the partial derivatives of the aggregate with respect to any one of these variables is reasonably are they're all reasonably small and um uh, uh, and if the random variables are uh, are independent uh, you get um uh, uh, you, you get very good probabilities on their deviating from the mean called the Chernoff bounds, very classical bound. In fact, it was it's even earlier due to Bernstein from the 1920s or something, uh, right? And the nice thing is, in fact, this was in a paper I uh, wrote with Alessandro Panconesi that also won the Dijkstra Prize. That uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to ask exactly this one. I think that's a good time to talk about it. I mean, this Dijkstra Prize actually is a I mean, very prestigious prize that. Uh, also, Professor Nogal and that he actually got that one because of the streaming algorithm. Yeah, so I think you can combine this one and yes. talk about okay. both of them. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So yeah. So now, so, so so recall the notion of cylinder negative correlation I mentioned before. So what this paper of Panconesi and myself showed is that now let's say you have binary random variables x1, x2, x3, etc. that are only cylinder negatively correlated, but not necessarily. Uh, but not necessarily independent, right? So for example, suppose you're drawing uh, balls from this uh, box that, that has red balls and blue balls, and your interest, and again, xi for, uh, is, is equal to one if the ith ball is red and zero otherwise, right? Now, suppose you're interested in the sum um, x2, uh, let's just take the even numbers, right? Just for simplicity, it can be anything, but suppose x2 plus x4 plus x6 plus x8 plus x10, right? You're interested in the second ball, fourth and sixth and eighth and tenth. You, you want to count how many of them are equal to red. And that's exactly x2 plus x4 plus x6 plus x8 plus x10, right? Let's call this a random variable y. What, so, so we know that the xi's are all cylinder negatively correlated with each other, right? Then what we showed in our paper is that for the turn off bounds to hold, you don't need independence. Cylinder negative correlation suffices, basically. Right, so uh, so therefore you can get uh, you know th this random variable y is concentrated around its mean, uh, you know although the xi's are not independent of each other. Right, so in general the advantage with um, negative correlation is you get these large deviation bounds essentially for free. So asking for uh, yeah so so and then the stronger notions of negative dependence that I mentioned, like negative uh, association and strongly really have even more powerful properties, like conditional negative correlation, all kinds of stuff, very interesting stuff. Um, yeah, so, so in those cases, uh, uh, when there is negative dependence, you can think of this informally this way, right? You see, if you negatively correlated random variables, you can think of them as having a self-correcting behavior. Again, think of them as either being zero or one, right? Suppose I keep drawing, uh, uh, you know, these balls at random from this box, and suppose I tell you that among, uh, you know, let's say initially there is an equal number of red and blue balls, right? Maybe two hundred red, two hundred blue, right? But in the first thirty that I picked, suppose I tell you that twenty-five are red. It's it's possible it can happen, right? Then this phenomenon has a self-correcting behavior, right? Then the chance that the thirty-first ball that I pick is going to be blue goes up, right? So if the first many are red. The later tend to be blue. So if these are pushing in one direction, the others push in the other direction. So they tend to self-correct, right? That's why informally, these functions like x2 plus x4 plus x6 plus x8 plus x10 stays close to its mean. If there is an initial phenomenon, it cannot tip over the whole thing, right? The others will push back. But in the opposite direction, in the gifts example where you know we had Mohammed being happy, my being happy. Suppose I tell you that I was happy. You only condition on Mohammed being happy, I being happy, and some other person being happy. It increases the chance that yet another person is also happy yeah, because yes, the gifts yes, are all activated independently, right? So if an initial four or five people tip it in one direction, it has the tendency to tip even more, right? So in such cases, you do not expect sharp concentration around the mean. You expect the, the tail to be very long, basically. It can either go one way or the other. And this phenomenon turns out to be tricky. And in fact, like, like Mohammed said, on the positive uh, correlation side, there are tools to deal with it. For example, there is a famous inequality due to Swante Janssen called the Janssen's inequality. Uh, and that was useful in some approximation algorithms like group Steiner and so on. And, and coming back to your question, Mohammed, on uh, that paper with Pan Kunesi that got the, the extra prize, it, it introduced, it, it first proved this, uh, the turn off type bounds for uh, a negatively, for negatively correlated, cylinder negatively correlated random variables. 
And also its primary focus was on this IoT like thing that I mentioned, where let's say you have some devices uh, either in the wild or in the cloud or something, each device wants some resources and it only knows I, I'm a, a device that currently needs maybe some power and some, you know, some uh, data from some da databases. I know that I'm interested in say these sources, S1, S2, and S3. Another person, another device may be interested in S2, S5, S10, and S20, and so on. So you can think of this implicitly as a bipartite graph between let's say these sensors on the one hand and resources on the other. And I want to talk to the resources I care about and get some stuff from them. And the resource can only handle one person at a time. So you want a distributed algorithm, not a centralized algorithm, but distributed algorithm to schedule this communication. It naturally becomes an edge coloring problem on a bipartite graph. And we showed how to develop very fast uh, distributed randomized algorithms for edge coloring using these te techniques that we developed for negatively correlated random variables. So, so that was uh, that paper. Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah, I think this uh, intuition actually was a great one for why we have this kind of uh, this kind of concentration bonds that are very important uh, for lots of applications. Why do we have it? While we have also still we have negative correlation. This thing, this self correcting that was actually very nice. You mentioned that. Alvin always give very nice intuitions about the uh, things. Uh, so that's uh, great. So uh, I was actually uh, just uh, reading, some person actually asked me this one. I think that's an interesting question. So uh, like they, they asked me, are you reading like, the, so I think you have been also here in US probably more than half of your life. Are you still reading the news from uh, uh, India? Yes, I do. Yeah. Regularly, are you doing that? Oh, I see, yeah. I, I would say regular, yeah, it's interesting, you know, so, Andy Yao, if I may quote him, he once mentioned, I mean, so as you know, he was uh, born in Shanghai, raised in Taiwan, then was in the North America for many years and went back to China in 2005. Another very inspiring person for me, a very kind man, a Turing Award winner, a great scientist, and just, uh, you know, a very inspiring person. Uh, around 1993, he told me that as you get older, the culture you were born into kind of you know, you, you become sort of more fascinated by it, more drawn to it. So, I mean, when I was a father of young children and so on, you're very busy with your career. I, I, I like following the news and I mainly followed American news, but now I follow both American and Indian news as well as international news. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like a product of multiple cultures. And so, I, yes, I, I think it's not just me, essentially. It's natural. I think you have been born here. So part of your life, maybe the earlier life is there. I don't know. Maybe the second life might be different. But yeah, the first life is the, I mean, all this kind of memory that you have it. And, and checking on this news, of course, some of them are disturbing. But, you know, that's that's it. I mean, you need to, I mean, you hope for the best maybe later. Uh, great. Uh, so that was one question. Now let's go. Actually, I think we talk about uh, this one. And and uh, wait a minute. Uh, one question: What was the relation of this with the distributed uh, things? I think that was the sensor networks. That was another question that you mentioned. Uh, so question that somebody asked. So this was about the so uh, this uh, uh, digester about the relation to distributed computing was this kind of sensor networks. Am I right? Uh, more generally distributed um, uh, distributed agents that want to do some coordination. The particular type of coordination we were interested in is, is distributed uh, edge coloring of a graph, of an implicit graph. And the model for it is basically, you know, let's say you have some processes and some resources. This process wants certain resources. It wants to reserve times for them, right? And similarly, there are many processes and there is no way we can coordinate among all of them. Right, and you want a fast schedule by which everybody is happy. Graph theoretically, you have a bipartite graph with, let's say, maximum degree delta. It's well known that delta colors are necessary and sufficient to to color a bipartite uh, to edge color a bipartite graph. You need uh, it's necessary and sufficient, but the, of course, the classic algorithms are centralized. Right? Suppose you want a distributed algorithm. What we showed. It's, e, it's e, by a distributed algorithm, I mean that if I'm a process that wants service from these three resources, I can only talk to them. I have no idea what the other resources are, the other processes are. Similarly, a, a resource will only talk to the processes that, that talk to it, right? By just by the simple local communication without knowing anything about your large graph topology, can, can, can you come up to a good edge coloring of this graph, which corresponds to a schedule for these processes to access their resources. Can you compute, first of all, uh, a good edge coloring? So that is one thing. And second, you want this uh, distributed algorithm to terminate very fast. 
it should be much, much faster than any centralized algorithm. The, that was the motivating problem, distributed edge yeah. basically. Great, thanks, I think, for that answering the question. So, okay, so uh, I think we will come back to the social network and a little bit of more applied stuff after this, but let me ask, I mean, this uh, talk about these things. I think there's a new topic that maybe we didn't talk in the live before about, I mean, being editor in chief of a major journal. So I think there are actually in terms of algorithms, uh, I mean, these are the early on journals, but one of the algorithmic that I was, when I was even undergrad, I went to Sharif University, I was reading that book. And the other one was the journal of algorithms that later on, I mean, due to some issues, the publisher issues in some sense, turned into a new journal, which is ACM Transaction on Algorithm. So uh, I'm happy, I'm glad that I'm actually the editor-in-chief of Algorithmica for, I don't know, past nine months. But uh, actually, Arvind was the uh, editor-in-chief of ACM Transaction Algorithm. The other, I think these are the two important ones, especially focused on algorithms, ACM Transaction on Algorithm for six years. So of course, we have been all editors and probably others. They have been editors. Editors is more like, I will just define the work is that, you are getting some papers, editor-in-chief assigns it to you, and then you try to find referees, and then you will decide based on the referees. That's, I mean, the typical things that is happening. Now, what about being editor-in-chief? I think that is important because the time that I uh, accepted versus now, I think I have a quite different view about it. So uh, what are even actually the, uh, like when you sign to be editor in, like sign to be editor-in-chief of a journal, what are the, expectation from you, what are your responsibility? Uh, which I will say, I mean, quite a bit different from being an editor. Yeah, I think that's for you, the podium, just talk about it and I will, I think we we'll discuss a little bit more about this. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so of course there is the sort of routine work that you have to do, which is, you know, papers keep coming essentially every week. You have to either desk reject them or uh, send them to, to, to one of the editors. So if the paper looks a little suspicious, you want to spend uh, you know some amount of time understanding it and if there are obvious problems you know so tell the author that they really need to fix those before reconsideration or of course typically you you, you have to think of an editor and you have to, you want to balance of course the workloads as well as expertise of different editors and the other routine work of course is that you have to regularly you know chase after editors and in some cases if the editor is finding it very difficult to find referees or if some referee is being very slow you have to personally either approach the referee or, or find <laughs> other uh, uh, you know reviewers to, to review the paper this is all you know the the stuff that you have to do every week basically but i try to do a few more things uh, some successfully some unsuccessfully so one thing I try to reinstitute is that for uh, SODA, which is a top algorithms conference, every year, you know, some, uh, you know, some of the best papers, selected papers, uh, you know, get fast tracked into uh, the ACM transactions and algorithms, of course, with the, with the regular uh, reviewing process, but hopefully faster and to have a special issue of the journal every year corresponding to some SODA. Uh, you know, so that was a lot of work, but I thought that was helpful. Um, the other thing I try to do is also to, uh, to, to I mean, uh, as you know, Mohammed very well, algorithms and computer science are a big tent these days. And, you know, they, you know, I try to involve some of the more modern topics like machine learning and so on, uh, identify some, uh, you know, strong, uh, you know, uh, people in these areas, you know, try to appoint them as editors and ask them if they can, uh, you know, run special issues. Uh, or you know, talk to you know the, the uh, you know the, uh, some of the best people in their areas and convince them to submit papers. Some of these initiatives were were successful, some were not. But I think yes. So there is both the routine aspect, which is that you want to keep the journal running well in its regular operations, as well as you know looking out into the future, looking out into how the field is is growing and seeing what you can do in terms of whether there is an area we need to expand to, whether there are conferences we need to reach out to. Uh, you know, people we want to generally be involved with the running of the journal and so on. So the, there were these multiple, uh, you know, it's a, as you very well know, it's a lot of work. And already as professors and researchers, uh, we wear multiple hats. That was another hat, but I feel, um, you know, thankful for the experience. I, I feel that I could do my bit for the community. The community has done a great deal for me. Uh, yeah, so th th those were broadly, I would say, and it's probably very similar to your experience. Uh, great. Yeah, I think these are several important things that you have mentioned. I think I wanted to add a little bit about this that I can. I didn't have this one. But like as an editor, somebody asks you, do you want to be editor of a journal? And we are all, I mean, 
editors of several journals. And then you are doing that. So it's a routine thing. But uh, interestingly, uh, I think that might be again different from one publisher to others because generally these are the major publisher. I think this uh, for ACM transactional algorithm, of course, the ACM public, uh, publishers here, it is a spring, uh, Springer Nature, which is again very, I mean, that actually has joined Springer and Nature. Nature is a very famous uh, journal. They are this is Springer Nature that they have algorithmica. And so one interesting thing that when you sign some of these the contract, actually is quite different from, I didn't sign any contract to be editor, but to be editor in chief, actually you need to sign a contract. And this contract actually says some of this, that you're responsible. This is like in some sense, it is your journal. You will be responsible essentially if something bad happens in this journal as the editor in chief. And you should be very careful about this, that you cannot just do it uh, like, uh, so, okay, some editors accept it, then I accept it. You are responsible. Another thing actually is interesting is that you are promising that you are providing enough uh, publication for the journal. So that's another expectation that, I mean, that if you cannot bring enough publications, so you need to find essentially publications that are good for the journal. And of course they should be good. And then you will bring it to the thing. Generally, a little bit payment is involved, maybe. But I think if you want to go for the payment, you can do much, much better things than the time that you are spending. It's, I think it's a lot of work. And I mean, actually, for me, it became more and more during the time, especially if you have some ideas and you want to implement those ideas, like you want to bring the quality of the journal up. I mean, the better get better papers. Then actually, it takes more time. You need to talk and you need to be in contact. So this is one of the things that actually... Uh, the people are sending. And of course, I mean, sometimes somebody say, okay, why is my paper got rejected? It should have not been rejected. Then you need to read all these things and or something goes wrong in the submissions. You are all get involved in uh, this type of thing. But at the same time, I mean, there is this kind of aspect of leadership, I will say, that is also important. That you have, I mean, very good set of editorial board that you invite them or they have been there. And I mean, these are all, I mean, very generally, I mean, uh, well-known people and you need to deal with them. And, you know, it is not the easiest thing that, you know, I mean, to a person is a well-known as, okay, why you didn't do the work? Because they don't generally get such kind of emails from others that, I mean, these are like advisors or others and why you didn't do the thing. I mean, you need to write it very nicely and mention that, okay, you are not answering after a few things. The people are, the authors are essentially... Uh, sending emails saying why well, is it going with our paper so this is their responsibilities and at the same time you understand they are busy so this is also this kind of trade-off that how do you want to talk with these people i mean maybe ping them a few times and still like that does not look bad uh, i think that is important to have this kind of emotions also in place and you know that again the people are busy maybe they don't answer it even to the second thing, maybe you need to send the, the third one. But I think that I found actually interesting that, I mean, even I ping like after two, three times, the people actually at the end, they are coming and okay, we are sorry that they didn't do it. I find it actually very, I mean, like uh, say, okay, boy, I'm sending, I do not answer it. But the person generally are coming and say, okay, we are sorry. And of course, I mean, this happens for uh, all of these things. But uh, these are some of the things that you may need to follow the people and again, this is some kind of leadership that you are, I mean, when you are advisor, a large group, you are doing the same thing. When you are in a company, you are a manager of the group, you need to do that. Uh, but again, the difference here is that these people are not necessarily reporting to you in that sense of being an advisor or being a manager in a company. But here, I mean, these are well-known people that you are working with them and you are very happy for their help for the journal. And at the same time, you need to get some reviews from them because the authors otherwise pinging you. That was, I think that's a nice experience for me. And I think, and again, you you can, this is, this is also exciting that you have your own journal because generally I think, uh, I don't remember about ACM transaction algorithm, but like for example, in Algorithmica, they, in the first page, they are writing their, your name. So in some sense, this is, they will see your name there. And it's actually exciting to have your book and you want to improve the quality of the book. You know, we have this uh, recent book actually that we had it, of course, that night. But this one, in some sense, every issue that is going is my book. So I need to prepare uh, good things for it. But yeah, that's actually very interesting uh, and exciting uh, things, but a lot of work, I think. Any person who wants to do that, it is important. And I think it is also important to answer emails fast. If you don't answer emails fast, maybe that's not the best thing for you because I think that it just adds, there are lots of blockage 
in these uh, things that, I mean, lots of things they may have been delayed. The worst thing that can happen is that you also delayed further by don't answer the emails or forget answering emails. I think that's my experience. I don't know, do you want to add anything else? Uh, yeah, so for the for ACM TALG, I'm not sure I had to sign a contract to my knowledge and there was no payment kind of thing. But of I course, there are expectations. Yeah, expectations that you, you know, uh, you know, so keep the quality high, etc. cetera. Uh, since it's, run, yeah, so I, I think it probably is run a little bit differently, but yeah, uh, but it is true. It is, it, the other things you mentioned are, of course, very common. Uh, you know, it is unfortunately the case that, you know, some senior people don't respond in time. Uh, you know, I think that's a, the, that's a pity. I mean, I, I can understand if they're unable to review, but once you accept the reviewing job to, you know, to, to uh, have unreasonable delays is not a good idea and it becomes very tricky to remind them and so on. Some cases I found it's be best to, you know, if I could understand the paper, I go ahead and read it myself or read part of it or, you know, ask people I know very well, responsible people as, as a, as a one-time favor and they try to do it. Yeah. So, but I, as, as I, I think you do, I still consider journals as important and perhaps we can talk about why that is the case. Maybe let me ask you, you know, why do you, you know, a lot of young people primarily publish in the top conferences. So why, uh, why did you become the editor in chief of a journal? What, what faith do you have in the, in the need for journals? Uh, I think that it's, uh, I mean, uh, that is an interesting uh, question here. I think it is good to have the journals, that's the uh, things, because the people, I mean, the conferences, that is, uh, I think uh, one thing that I, this is from a, uh, the famous actually computer scientist, maybe I don't want to say the name, but he was actually mentioning that it is like very good for in the computer science, because this is computer science is a bit different from the other areas, almost every other area, that we are publishing mainly in conferences, almost every other field they are publishing in journals. So having essentially being, I mean, having a journal in computer science, it might be a bit different. So people uh, try to publish in the conferences. Uh, one interesting thing that was, I mean, person was mentioning is that it is very good. I mean, that we have the, so for conferences, we always say that some other details, et cetera, they are coming in the journal version, in the full version. I think nowadays with the archive, et cetera, you need to actually provide them. But at that time, there were not much of archive and you have just this eight page, I don't know, 10 pages or something like this that you could do it. So it was good even for journal versions also mentioned it comes in the next conference, the details. So of course it is not the case. But uh, this is actually, I think this is the part that, I mean, the buck stops at journals. So at the journal, you need to have everything essentially. And when you put it on archive, it's not necessarily uh, it's reviewed. Not reviewed right? yeah. It's not officially reviewed. Of course, the people may read it. But at this time, it is some kind that, I mean, somebody comes and all the details, if they are not there, I mean, somebody asks you, okay, put the details. Because unfortunately, we have seen, I have seen several of these. Uh, this is one, actually, this is another statement from late, uh, uh, actually, uh, great scientist Gary, uh, David Johnson, who was actually my boss, I'm very proud. And unfortunately, he uh, uh, essentially passed away due to, uh, I mean, some malpractice, uh, I will say, that is important uh, due to, I mean, he had cancer, but I think that is more because of these issues that is malpractice. But, but anyhow, so that was the interesting thing that he was mentioning that maybe if you put a claim, if you don't put it in a final journal format, for five years it is for you. But after that, the others can grab it. And this is, I mean, makes sense because some of the time that people, I mean, claim something is correct and the results is not correct, the details are not, I mean, I don't say it's not correct, but maybe the details are not there. You claim something and nobody can work on that problem or expand it because somebody, oh, there's a proof by this guy, then what we want, you don't have any. So in that sense, that's a great thing to have the journal such that you can actually mm -hmm. publish the latest version. And of course, it's a lot of work because the people have less incentives. But this is, uh, I think this is another uh, professor at, CMU, I think Cornelius, if I mention his... Uh, Cornelius? Yeah, Cornelius, yeah. So he was actually, it was interesting. He was mentioning to me that for this uh, perfect graph uh, uh, conjecture that became theorem, actually, is a great thing that, uh, I mean, uh, Robertson, uh, Seymour, and Thomas, and uh, I think... Uh, Maria Chudnowski. Yeah, they solved essentially that one. He said that for that one, they were sending to the journal and... For one month, every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., I went to the office and checked the correctness of this group. It was like something like 100, 200 pages. Actually, that was the time that I was a graduate student at MIT. And he mentioned that he spent so much amount of time, one month, every day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and then just reading and checking this. Of course, this 
I mean, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, that, uh, I mean, probably not, unfor not fortunately, that does not happen in computer science. I mean, the people don't want to, they, during this time, probably they can publish a few papers, why right? they should have spent this one and just reading the other. But at the same time, this is a science. And this is especially important because this is a mathematical science. That's probably one of the things that I'm very happy to work in this one, because you can give definite answers to some question. It is correct or not. That's, you cannot do it in other lots of science, essentially, that we have it. So in some sense, having the journal is important. The people have other incentives. If you can find good mechanism, you know, I'm working on a game theory. If you can find some mechanism that everyone gets benefit out of it, and you can have a better thing, I think that would be, that would be a good thing. That was the reason, actually, I was decided to take this job. And I think I enjoyed I mean, some of the initiative that I have put in some of the things. I'm learning that is the uh, great thing. And again, this leadership aspect actually is a very nice one that you are, you need to work actually satisfy lots of these guys, the, the publishers, which is a big guy, and also the, like the editors who are very well known people and you need to work and the authors. So it is a, I don't know, multi-party market that you need to satisfy and you need to design some mechanisms. There. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, people say, you know, on the one hand, why do you need journals? Because let's say a very famous result comes up, right? And it just posted on the archive or published in a conference, but you know, it's not reviewed fully, right? Then, you know, it's such a famous result that many people will read it. But, you know, science is not just about the end product of famous results, right? There are often lots of small ingredients that lead up to that, right? What if there is a bug in some paper here that, you know, went unchecked, right? And I'm especially concerned, for instance, I, I publish in the AI data science ML like conferences, as you know, they're now very, very large. Uh, you know, so so I, you know, I still try to publish my papers from these conferences and journals, um, uh, you know, to the extent I can. Uh, but I'm worried that, you know, the number is so high, you know, it's very hard to, I mean, people probably do keyword search or something, but it's very hard to see a body of knowledge developing systematically. And of course, the bigger worry is if there are proofs and claims and so on, you know, that they've not been checked, uh, you know, thoroughly like a journal should. So I, I, I think that that's a, that is an issue, but and certainly in a rigorous sub-discipline like ours, where claims have to, you know, proofs have to be correct and so on, yeah, most uh, stuff is mathematical. You really uh, need a forum like journals for, you know, where, you know, thorough vetting happens. And I hope that, you know, our community and, you know, in, in general scientists, continue to see this as a valuable part of our service, you know. Yeah, I think that is actually a very important thing. I think uh, actually we feel go next to this, uh, also this topic that you are now publishing more in this uh, triple AI and NURIPS versus maybe sort of access like that we are doing. I mean, like what are good things about these conferences? And uh, I mean, maybe the more applied things that also you are doing that has the effect on that. But before that, I think that was a very important one. Like I think this year NURIPS, had more than, I think, 10,000 submissions and they accepted 25%. And it is like quite, I mean, I understand the rank, there is lots of, I mean, there are some good reviews that the people actually checked in more theory things, but there is still lots of randomness in accepting and rejecting the things. There is another one like ICML. And there was this uh, discussion in Twitter, okay, this paper that you got it at, at the best paper award in ICML, the people actually mentioned in their review that it has some serious bug and you are essentially doing that. And more, there was some other, I think people that they mentioned, actually uh, it was, that was a discussion. If I read a paper and the most of the proof seems correct to me, then I will be happy. And this actually is like the mind blowing. What do you mean by most of the proof? Like this is exactly the mathematical time. One sentence is wrong. The value of the whole proof is zero essentially. And you cannot, so you say most of the proof is like, and it is interesting actually, if you don't have this condition that one sentence wrong, the whole thing is wrong. I think that was, uh, who did me? I think the uh, professor Madhusud on that was the thing that he mentioned. So if you have one wrong statement, you can prove anything that you want. So the only thing is the matter of whether there exists that one wrong sentence or not. Otherwise you can't prove anything. So you can of course write a very nice story of the approach, et cetera. But at the end there is one place that is not working and the whole thing is the value is zero. And this large number of publications that we have it, the people may not check it actually carefully and they will build on it, unfortunately. I mean, the only hope that I have it essentially is that the people generally when they build on some important things, at least they have checked their, those results. That's the hope. And if maybe there are some bugs in some, non-important one, maybe this, I mean, 
Yes. It's not important by default, so they are not much building. But as you mentioned, if the people build on something, they create something, and then they, they found actually there's some important bug in some early one that the people didn't check it carefully. I think that's the whole beauty of math and theoretical science will be violated in that sense for uh, that issue. Yeah, so uh, 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 given that, I think, yeah, so like, uh, do we have, I mean, like, we are publishing more in the AAA and Nurips and others. I think you are publishing more. So what is, I mean, why you are going more to this applied science? Is this just a thing that also you get more into like more applied uh, research or like with Amazon and others? Yeah. Yeah, for multiple reasons. So one is my uh, interests are also in many applied areas and, you know, but my personal contributions are still algorithmic, mathematical modeling, this kind of stuff. But I really enjoy working on, you know, some of the broader areas and of course, you know, forums like AAAI and NeurIPS are, 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 are natural because they're often about, you know, inferring a distribution and then taking actions based on a probability distribution. And, and also part of the problems I work on like kidney exchange are, are uh, in general examples of deployed AI. So th these forums, the, I, I, I broadly think of myself as working in data science more than AI and so on. So, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, these data related problems interest me. In fact, I, I thank you for uh, one of my introductions to this because you and I and others, we wrote an AMAS paper. In yeah, exactly. That's one of the things. I think that's yeah. when your second child had just been born. And uh, yeah. you know, I, I also went to Turkey for the conference, but I mean, uh, that was on e-commerce and so on. And you know, yeah. it was an early, for me, an early introduction. I, I'd done stuff before on sample complexity in machine learning and so on. I'm, I'm interested in pack learning. In fact, even in the 90s, I'd done some work on sample complexity in a few different models of learning. Uh, and then I had some papers in KDD and so on. But, uh, you know, I think our, our work rekindled my interest. And yes, in the last several years, these uh, data science and ML like forums have been uh, where I've been focusing attention on, although I still work on uh, algorithms like uh, problems very much. Yeah. So uh, have you published any of like the work in Amazon in any of them or that? No, not not yet, actually, not yet, but hopefully in the, in the, in the near Yeah, future. hopefully, I think that is one thing that I hope that Amazon becomes better in terms of the allowing the science actually be distributed among uh, other things. Uh, great. Yes, uh, yeah, I guess allow, but you know, it's just that my own work within Amazon has not been, you know, a natural fit for publication, but more for internal use. And my publication work has been from UMD and more on you know the, the scientific areas I'm interested in. But I think there is a large intersection, and I do hope that. I do plan. I, I do believe that next year we'll have some, you know, um, Amazon work that also appears as, as publications. Yeah. I think uh, this is correct. So some of the work that I have done is actually at Amazon was like that as well. I think some of them, if there's a push for you to do that, that was the thing that I have seen at Google. Again, Google 2005. I had an offer from them. I, I mean, we then took it and I went to postdoc actually. But I think at that time it was different, like the time that I was there, 2016. Like it was a NURIPS deadline or ICML deadline. All people in this large fellow, they are all working on the papers for the uh, ICML and NURIPS. I think that's the environment that if you don't work on that, then you feel, oh, there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not there. But but I think it like, yeah, this culture, when I experienced at least it was not in the Amazon ads or something like this. That this is, there were like some of Amazon conferences the internal conferences that actually the people were working for it, but not for these more natural things. And I think that is important that, I mean, if you obtain something, actually you can give it back and such that the others can use it and build on it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's about uh, this thing. And I think this conference that like NURIPS, AAA AI especially, I think the type of reviewing that they have it is quite different. But one of these NURIPS paper, I think we were involved into just uh, answering the referees back and forth, essentially. It's but more rigorous in that sense from a journal that for the two weeks, we were just answering these referees, essentially. Asking more questions, we answer again, ask questions. You don't see that one, essentially, in the theory conference that you submit it. Nowadays, they have added this oh, thing, the important one, rebuttal things. Yeah. But <laughs> otherwise, you just see the result, accept or reject, and that's it. But yeah, that's actually interesting to have that one. It takes a lot of time, but I think that's an interesting experience. It's, it's a good uh, development, I think. I also like the development, yeah. Yeah. And uh, quick, quick, uh, sorry, go ahead. sorry, a quick thing, you know, both at Bell Labs and Amazon and some other companies I've been involved with, I can understand their, you know, perspective, which is that, of course, some of them are, are kind of company secrets and are valuable for the company. So they have to be careful about what they let out. So that, that I can see that that perspective also. But yeah, if, they, if there is stuff that is just useful for the broader public, 
and not necessarily you know i mean uh, you know very valuable for the company itself or primarily from a patenting purpose it makes sense to to publish and to make your presence felt in the in the scientific world as well yeah yeah i think i mean you're right of course i mean these are like the patents and stuff is but the, the interesting thing about the patent is that actually patent is the one that was kamal jain actually mentioned these patents that you are publishing they are all public and stuff that the people can go and read it and should be careful actually what you are doing in the patent he was mentioning to me uh, i'm kamal jain uh, uh, but uh, here that was one other interesting thing about this for the i think they i mentioned actually this for example when i was at amazon so uh, there are two issues for publication becomes important the one issue is that if you don't publish outside, then the quality of the algorithm that you develop is not clear that what is the quality. Because you may you may know some knowledge, you may do some algorithm, but because you don't present it outside, this algorithm might be outdated, maybe not correct. And you just, among the few people around you, also this is a nice algorithm, let's implement it. But when you do it, if you need to really have this algorithm essentially that you want to implement it, publish in a conference, you have a much higher bar of satisfying this. So it should be much more novel and not just something and you get some promotion, et cetera. The other issue that's also very important, I mean, some of these basic problems, maybe not all the specification, but you can actually publish that. It's like some kind of crowdsourcing. The people from academia, they love actually to see nice problems. And they come and think about it, especially those that are coming from the practice, and think about it and develop for you. So you may have some problem. Maybe you don't have that much research or not much resources for this particular problem. You may publish it. Like a year from now, you will come and think there are lots of algorithms are developed for this one. And you can take some of them and use it. That's, again, some benefit that you can do it both uh, like uh, academia are using it because they don't they didn't have the this vision that you had it at the same time also you get benefit because you can now take the best set of the art and use it for free essentially so generally speaking yes I, I do think tech companies uh, you know very much want to engage with conferences uh, with sorry with uh, with conferences and academia so uh, you know I myself at Amazon for instance I spoke uh, along with an Amazon panel at stock by remote this year some number of you know um, you know stock related researchers, algorithms and complexity researchers at, at Amazon, including myself, we, we gave uh, presentations. I've also been you know, part of Amazon panels at, uh, at machine learning conferences and so on. I very much agree with you that there is a two-way you know, collaboration between Amazon and, uh, sorry, between industry and, and academics, yeah. Uh, great. Okay, so I mean, having said that, I think coming back to the research, I think one other thing that, uh, uh, like you can, uh, we didn't I mean, discuss that much about this kind of the social network and modeling disease networks in realistic urban social network. I think this is the paper that is published in Nature. And I think the people in maybe more computer science, they are publishing less in Nature. I think you may want to say why you decide to do Nature, talk about a little bit about the result as well. Oh, thank you, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've been fortunate to work with some collaborators uh, for about, uh, for 22 years or so on uh, on uh, what one can call computational epidemiology. So here, yeah, you, you really want to take a computational view and model of how a disease is or may spread over, let's say some, some geographic region and want various control mechanisms. I mean, while vaccine, uh, you know, of where to monitor and if vaccine is being, uh, you know, in the initial stages only being made available in small batches, you know, who to initially prioritize the vaccine to, what kind of message about quarantine versus vaccine, vaccination versus being out in the open, should you give to the public and so on, right? And you want to take a very uh, computational and, and mathematical approach to it. So this particular paper, so, Dif, uh, you know, kind of made a very rigorous uh, network model for how an infectious disease can spread through a population. So traditionally in epidemiology, the disease spread has been uh, modeled by assuming a homogeneous network, you know, so, so for example, a hospital ward where if a person P is infected, they're equally likely to infect Q or to infect R, right? So this infected person is equally likely to give the disease to anybody else in the population, right? But of course, this doesn't scale to any reasonable size population, like even a small town where people and infectious disease primarily goes from an infected person to those they come in contact with on a regular basis, right? Like their family members, work colleagues, you know, and if they take public transport, their bus, their bus or train driver and so on, right? So, so we came up with, uh, you know, a, a sort of network model for epidemiology and developed large scale simulations, some random graph based rigorous results, and then studied it for certain variants of influenza and 
SARS and so on. So, so that was the first study. Uh, I think it, is, uh, it has been helpful in initiating many such studies. And uh, it's really the, the, the computer science aspect has a range of um, features, including mathematical modeling, algorithms, random graph modeling, very large scale simulations, and work with epidemiology. So it's been a very satisfying thing. And of course, you know, COVID, COVID made all this appear, uh, you know, ma made all this obviously very necessary. And we worked with various government agencies as well. Just before COVID struck, in fact, we got a large uh, expeditions grant for this. So yeah, so, so that's an area I'm conti I continue to be very interested in. There are very many interesting problems that go from, you know, public policy to psychology to, you know, uh, you know, sort of stochastic processes like multiple diffusions happening on the same network or a, a network that is really multiple layers because there is an information layer where people are getting information, right? And then there is an actual disease layer and then there is a public policy layer, all of which interact. So it's, it's very fascinating and um, it's an area I feel fortunate to have been a part of and where I hope we can continue to make good contributions. Yeah, great. Actually, this is a nice area uh, that actually, like, you know, the theory that I mean, the models that we have it, actually, you might be able to use it to model, I think, this way that this spreading happened. That, that was actually interesting, see, that, like, like if some person is, I mean, has a disease, the probability that give it to different people actually might be different. I think that's the, one of the main things in this one, which is actually interesting uh, things we may not think about that way. And if you know this, that we can work it. Mm -hmm. Much better on that. Uh, great. So uh, I think uh, let me combine. Uh, I mean, two questions here, and then can I mean after that? I think uh, yeah. There was a. Uh, oh, uh, let me ask you uh, this. Uh, yeah, let's research. Then we will go. I mean, for a few other things, and then we will uh, finish the uh, live. So the thing is, there any part that I think about any other research that we did not cover that you want to cover? And that's one thing. And the other one is that, I mean, we always, I mean, we have added this thing that you want to talk about two, three big problems in the, I mean, computer science, I mean, maybe more applied things that you think that I mean, can be applied thing essentially that the people are doing in applied systems or others, uh, cloud computing, et cetera. That you think that if these are, these problems are solved, I mean, we will be very happy and these are like the major open problems in the field. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, so about the first part of your question, there, there are a few other areas that I enjoyed working on. One is uh, related to the Lovas local lemma, which is a very powerful, simple, actually a very easy lemma to prove by Erdős and Lovas, uh, in, uh, published in a paper of Erdős and Lovas from 1975, that I've really had a, a great deal of enjoyment understanding different aspects of. Uh, it, it's basically a simple, sufficient condition to prove that you can simultaneously avoid a whole number of undesirable events. With positive probability, it is simultaneously true that this bad event has been avoided and this can be avoided and this and this and this simultaneously. And it gives a simple sufficient condition for this. So in the 90s, in fact, along with your advisor, Tom Layton and Satish Rao and others, I worked on um, extending the local lemma um, in, the, in what was then primarily the non-constructive sense and the non-algorithmic sense. And starting from 2010, uh, 2009, 2010, I've, uh, I've enjoyed working on various constructive aspects of the local lemma, particularly motivate, motivated by a breakthrough uh, paper of Moser and Tardosh. So that's one area that I've really enjoyed working on. Uh, another area that, um, uh, you know, another, it's not an area, it's a problem I really enjoyed working on is hypergraph two coloring, which, which generalizes graph coloring. And there again, you want, to get, you want some sufficient conditions for when a hypergraph can be two colored, basically. Here, basically, a hypergraph is basically a collection of sets that can intersect with each other, right? So let's say you have a universe U and various subsets of this universe U that, are, that can intersect arbitrarily. And let's say every, every one of these sets is of size K, right? You want to assign a color to each of the uh, vertices in the, in the universe, either red or blue, such that every one of these sets, S1, S2, S3, et cetera, sees at least one red color and at least one blue. In other words, it's not monochromatic. This is called two colorability and you want various sufficient conditions um, for this to happen. And you know, along with Jay Kumar Radhakrishnan in the late nineties, uh, you know, we developed some uh, improved sufficient conditions, which still have not yet been improved, but I'm optimistic that, you know, they will be improved. 
Uh, just I think to add, I think the applications of it, for example, would be for fair clustering, because that's the thing that you want to have diversity and each of these clusters in some. That's a good point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So suppose you have various committees and you want, you know, committee. Uh, yeah. So so yeah, you want to you, you want good representation of both red and blue, where red and blue have some semantics, then that can be there. Another area that I really enjoyed is something I referred to, which is the derandomization and pseudo randomness. Uh, I primarily worked in the 1990s on this. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I really benefited from working with my collaborators and understanding these areas. And like Mohammed said, uh, you know, my, my own recent uh, work has been a mix of both theory and uh, applied areas. In terms of uh, problems that would be really great to solve, maybe I can say some from general theoretical computer science, which seems solvable, which are big problems, but which seem solvable. Yeah, uh, that's great. I think we have this one, I mean, that I mentioned. Some of the problem actually we had is some papers like in a stock and other, and we refer actually to some talks that, I mean, there is something in the paper, but in the talk is much more clear that's an open problem. So I think we hope that the people are, so these are the open set of problems that the people can come and think about it. So yeah, any problem, please feel free to mention. Uh, yeah, so I, I was thinking, and uh, so, so one is graph isomorphism, right? Which is given two graphs, G1 and G2, it's a classic problem whereby renaming the vertices on the same number of vertices, whereby renaming the vertices in G1 to the same labels in G2, you get identical graphs. In other words, is this graph G1 isomorphic to G2, except that the vertex labels have been changed in, in one of them, right? Uh, as, as many of you know, is a classic problem, which um, has not is not yet known to be solvable in polynomial time, but there are strong reasons why it's not NP-complete. Maybe your book, uh, Mohammed, that's coming out will, will re maybe reference this problem, uh, but it's considered an NP intermediate problem. And a, a major breakthrough by Latsi Babai around 2015 was a quasi polynomial algorithm, quasi polynomial time algorithm, which runs in time n to the poly log n. So that really, you know, you know, makes it very seem very likely that it can be solved in polynomial time. Interestingly, uh, there were also significant efforts in quantum algorithms. Uh, in the in the 90s and 2000s about whether there could be this problem is is at least in quantum polynomial time before showing that it's in classical polynomial time even that is still open i think that seems like a doable problem within the next maybe 15 years or so so that's one thing another of course that would be great to resolve and is the unique games conjecture and subhash koth the the originator of the of the conjecture you know when he was asked maybe 10 years ago he said I think it should be resolved in within two decades or something. But for example, vertex cover, which is a very fundamental uh, minimization problem, which is given a graph, uh, what is the minimum number of vertices uh, such that every edge has at least one endpoint in this set in the small subset of vertices? There is a very simple classic two two approximation for this. And assuming certain versions of the unique games conjecture, you cannot do better in polynomial time. Even regardless of the unique games conjecture, it would be really uh, very nice to understand the complexity of vertex cover. Uh, finally, one thing, Mohammed, you know, since you you again have worked on a whole range of areas, including fine-grained algorithms, one interesting growing area is you know fine-grained complexity of quantum algorithms, which. Uh, you know, it seems like a very interesting area. I would, you know, I mean, it would be really great to see progress on these. In terms of my own personal interests, I, I'd I really love to see progress in understanding why deep neural networks and reinforcement learning have been so successful. As you know, it is still mo much more of an art than a science. We don't yet have rigorous methods to, I mean, there are some, as, uh, I didn't mean to say there aren't any, but we still need more of a rigorous foundation for, for, for the success of deep learning. It would be great to do that. And along with it, I hope, uh, you know, that computer science, you know, one worry that I have is sometimes these, you know, these uh, deep networks work on a large number of cores for days or something. You know, energy consumption is, of course, a, you know, a huge worry and, and climate change and so on. I hope as algorithms and computer science people, we can make an impact on this, at least in terms of the carbon footprint of, of, uh, of servers and, you know, of, of, uh, of learning methodologies and so on. One last thing, you started out with a social issue, Mohammed. I, I, one social issue that worries me a lot, one thing that concerns me is climate change. Um, another is that society in general is getting polarized due to social media and others, and where instead of most people getting some kind of ground truth to, through, say, the daily newspaper, right? 
it's very very easy for us each person to go to their own social media sites that interest them and only watch videos and news items that interest them right i think it's i can see you know somebody asked about reading the news in the news sources that i consume and the comments that i read it's very clear that you know there are people large subsets of people who have no who have no common sources of ground truth information i believe in this you believe in that you know maybe there is a little bit of truth in what you and i believe but we totally don't speak the same language i th- i think it's a real concern for societies and again whether computer science can do something toward building better sort of social media mechanisms uh, you know that that ensure that you know in general there is uh, 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 you know there is better diffusion of information Uh, this kind of thing i mean eventually human psychology maybe we cannot do anything about but at least the technology part and what people get exposed to maybe uh, you know using through some paid mechanisms or whatever i i you know i i'm very interested in saying and in talking to people about what we as computer scientists can do so uh, great that, yeah. Uh, yeah so i think uh, just uh, i mean to add to that one i think for the second one of course in some sense i mean that is this kind of polarization that you mentioned somehow maybe computer science is to be blamed for it because these are part of it happens i think maybe the past 20 30 years that we have all these social networks that we created all these things that the people have the cell phones and they get the information from the cell phones i mean before it was just a phone they could call somebody you couldn't get all this information probably you are spend more time with your cell phone than anything else essentially and we get this data and i think in that sense it is somehow of course there are good benefits that the fact that i mean for example these events that are currently going in iran or other places like in ukraine i mean we didn't have any ideas there but now everyone has a camera i can just tweet send it to the whole world of course unfortunately there are this kind of interrupting the internet that again but there are some other things like i don't know starlink and others that can help probably on these things but i mean there are good things but there are bad things as well there are the things that yeah i mean uh, like this polarization the people i think that's part of the things because you have your cell phone this is your best friend so you will get all this information from this and you that unfortunately these are all these algorithms that are not facebook google others they are all based this kind of convergence to the thing that you like so in some sense you only by you will tell them that you like they can get more advertisement out of that so they will show exactly those things that you like and you don't even see the other things and i think this is the fact that if you some people believe in something like especially here different people they i think there is a complete disconnect or a big disconnect between the people because before again there was tvs you will go there and you will talk with each other there is not much tv even this is your cell phone you trained it this is your pet things yes. it tells you the thing that you like and yes. unfortunately it just tells you the thing that you like because that's a beneficial for this big company i think that's a big problem and i think some of this actually also mentioned uh, when we talked with professor david carger he also mentioned some of these issues and i think the other one that you mentioned for the uh, this uh, like a better way of computing i think that's also a great thing because if you think about it of course this uh, global warming is one thing but the other issue is that i mean uh, this computer uh, this is like uh, some of the things that i was that Amazon, there was a shift from uh, just uh, that we were doing, like we had some kind of cloud for ourselves for advertisement, but then they decided that no, you should shift it and you should use the actual AWS. And you need to know how much is the cost of these things. Because unfortunately, this is the thing that I, I mean, I was at Amazon at the early on and I noticed it before this move. And I heard like other places like Facebook and others. As you mentioned, this is a deep net. The people may not think that much. Just run a deep net. It is very easy. Anything that you want without really understanding it, you will run it. It takes a few days. And you may, uh, that is also interesting. If you are actually a company who are using or a startup, you are using this, then you will see the pain. Because the pain is that you are paying actually good amount of money in compute costs to this companies like a, comp- a relatively good computer not top computer it's something that you can do actually gpu things in amazon it charges more than 300 dollar per month while if you want to get just one computer to do just like some kind of website etc you can actually maybe do it by 50 dollar so you will pay six times more to do these things and if you are not careful i think it is again this kind of self correcting thing that hopefully for others 
they understand this. And I think that was also the thing that we will talk about virtually and this Ethereum, this is a recent move that happened very recently that it is proof of stake versus proof of work. That was another thing that there, there, again, there are some bad things about proof of stake, but I think they came that, okay, we cannot just spend computers to do that. But uh, yeah, I think these are uh, nice things. And again, this type of move is some kinds of help maybe to that. But again, proof of stake has a problem. It would be good to some find a middle ground such that <laughs> none of them have happened. So uh, great. So I think uh, one, uh, like, uh, uh, let me just see this one. A few, I think maybe like a uh, like shorter question, and I think we can uh, finish the thing. So one thing is that uh, like uh, uh, like in terms of being an administrator or things, have you ever talked about it? I mean, you have been, of course. Like at the, I think this is a statement that I heard from I mean several faculties and others even at the outside. Like each PhD student is like a startup that from the beginning to the end, I mean, especially if the successful one, it would be great things. And of course, it's a child as well, as we discussed. But uh, other things, I mean, have you ever thought about going like in the administrative things, I mean, up and how do you feel about this? Because that's also one question that we talked with several people as well. Yeah, I have thought about it. And uh, if the right opportunity comes up, I think I will see, consider it seriously. I mean, so uh, I've not, uh, yeah, so, so, I do think it's a very extremely impactful job. It's it's also a challenging job, and you know, if you want to do if you want to do a good job of it, it's truly many many hours a week. But I think that uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, academic management um, is is uh, you know, I mean, the the managers that came, the department chairs and deans and so on that came, you know, that uh, you know, I've been uh, you know, sort of uh, in the in the organization of both as a student and later as an employee have, have, have made my path easier, right? So I do think about doing these, you know, at some point. And uh, I think that people who are not just interested in careerism, but want to have an impact, it would be great to see more and more of people like this coming into this uh, sort of job and getting well-trained also. So because academic administration is something you don't get good training for. You just jump into it and do it. I think it would be good to have good training and support mechanisms because, of course, the person typically wants to continue to do re doing research, and you, you can't just expect them to you know crank up the number of hours per week arbitrarily, right? I mean, they have a family, they have other interests, right? But if there can be a good support mechanism for good academic academic administration, good training, and 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 sort of mentoring and you know nurturing and the ability for them to to keep to continue their research programs, that would be great, yeah. Yeah, I think that's I mean, great point, point that you mentioned. I, want, I think that I emphasize on that. I think uh, this is, I mean, for people like great researchers like yourself, essentially, I think it is very important that takes this administrative work. I think we talk actually with, I mean, several other people, we guess that we had it. It is, uh, I mean, it is super important because the people, I mean, they are strong in research, they are, I mean, they have always some other things to do, <laughs> maybe better things, more fun thing to do. When they take this one, they want to do have some effect essentially. Like for me, I mean, this taking, for example, this uh, algorithmica, I mean, editor in chief, I think this is the, some place that I think that I don't want this one. Uh, I want this such that I can make a, 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 some impact. If there is a such a place, I will be happy, but if not, I can leave it and do lots of other things that I have. It. And I think this is a very great mentality. I think we were discussing, I think that was with Professor Minglin, that you always want to put a, a person as a king, <laughs> that that person does not want to be the king. I think that was the story in the Netherlands about it. Because that's the best person. He has other opportunities. He does not want to dare, I mean, become a king. And like, if it is the case, unfortunately, I mean, this is a great thing that, I mean, US, there is this concept of democracy, shared governance. I think that's a great thing. And this should go to individual, I mean, places, units that we have in the, or departments or in college that, I mean, you see, I mean, some of them, we had it, these issues that we had it at uh, UMD actually, and this type of things, I mean, if you are not careful, you can easily go from democracy shared governance to something like more dictatorship or other things that the people may not like it. And it is important that people who are going there to not just build their career, of course, I think that we were talking with Professor Nagale, this naturally comes as a, Career builder, that's very good. But I mean, you always know that you want to go to give the service to the people, not just build for yourself. That's, I think the people also is very short sighted. If you think about the people, I think that's a great thing that I learned from Amazon. I mentioned in my classes this concept of customer obsession. When you go become a chair, when you become a dean, these are the people like the 
department or the college are your customers in some sense. Of course, there are students and others. And if you think about the customer, not Max, like this was the, I think this, I, I mentioned several, I mean, things that I didn't like at Amazon, but this is one of the things that I mentioned it. I think it's very important. In the meetings that they had it, they were talking about customer. Everything that you need to say that customer obsession and what is the thing for the customer. And whenever you even talk about the Amazon benefit, you were talking as the Amazon finance as a, one customer and you try to among other customers you want to maximize the benefit for that i think that's a very great view that you can see it like because if you see that one like in a college for example or a department if you go there i mean you should think these are your customers if you have the customer obsession you try to make them happy this concept of like this is i think the great thing that happened for amazon it becomes such a big company and it was i think it's a long time it was not even profitable but because, I mean, then when you care about the, uh, like, people and the customer, it, then more uh, people are coming and this kind of, like, for example, at Amazon, the value of the company went up because of more, much more people are coming. The same thing, I think, happens, for example, in the academic unit or other places that if you care about the people, this natural thing, the people will talk about you, say how great you have been. And that would be something that you can actually get benefit if you want to maybe build your career even further on with this kind of administrative thing. But going there and try to do that for your career, I think very short-sighted and in the long run, actually it hurts you. And you may not even actually see those other uh, uh, avenues beyond the current place that you are there. Uh, great, that was one thing. And I think it was the important thing to discuss. The other thing is that, uh, uh, what do you, uh, I mean, yeah, this is another thing I think that might be also important in the third one. Like your message for high schoolers that they want to study computer science. And in general, this is this idea that it might be asked by others that a talent versus hard work or luck in academia, in research or industry. So I think that maybe we can combine this one as well in a sense that if maybe I see that my grades are not best, maybe I'm not the best at school like in high school or others. And you mentioned that I mean, like this, this thing for you, it was like, regular things before and then you have of course then you have advanced uh, much more after that uh, so this kind of i mean talent versus hard work versus luck in academia research and industry and in general uh, any more uh, i mean messages that you have for high schoolers that they want to do computer science or industry and others uh, yeah so yeah thank you so yeah so uh you know, one thing for high schoolers is please remember that computer science, data science, and so on are really big trends. Many, many people can can do well in computer science, and um, you know, and even if you're interested in, you know, even if your primary interest is, um, you know, let's say medicine, right? The future of medicine, a lot of it is digital health and so on. I think understanding AI, understanding what code is, understanding basic security, all these mechanisms can be very, very helpful. So. Uh, so I, I, you know, and I, I do think that many universities, including ours, you know, tries to offer, you know, keep it a big tent and attract, you know, students from diverse backgrounds. So, I mean, if as a high schooler, you love programming, you love discrete math kind of thing, well, then computer science is obviously great for you. But even if you, you know, understand, you know, let's say in high school, you have not had enough, uh, you know, uh, classes in computer science, like in the US, AP classes and so on. Uh, but you want to try out the area, you like step-by-step -step logical reasoning, um, I would highly encourage that you, you, you at least think about it. I think everybody, if they have an idea of what code is, what computers can do, what modern AI is about, what data science is about, how you can sort of harness your data uh, you know, for, for your own purposes, I think we would all be better served. And even if you go into an entirely different looking discipline, I think it will benefit you. Uh, yeah, about talent versus hard work versus luck. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, some people obviously have enormous talent, right? So, but I think that in a way, uh, talent is overrated because most people cannot have spectacular talent. I mean, so, so that's by definition, a small number of people, right? But I think a large number of people can have very fulfilling lives in academia or industry with, a, with, with, you know, the only thing we can bring to the table really is, is, is hard work. And uh, I think people with the right attitude by hard work, I also mean communication skills and so on. I think that, you know, let me speak a little specifically and also a little broadly. 
So for instance, you know, I used to think for a long time when I was a PhD student and so on, who was interested very much in theoretical computer science that, you know, to really be a successful theoretical computer scientist, I should build such a strong math background. I tried to do many math classes in grad school or at least sit in on them, but I felt I never knew enough. I need to know algebraic geometry. I need to know topology, differential geometry, you know, areas that I had less knowledge of, right? So my sort of mental model was that to be a, you know, a person who has an impact in theoretical computer science, you need to have this enormous talent and which is built by, for example, understanding all these mathematical areas. But now my thinking is different. For instance, even in theoretical computer science, a mathematically grounded area, you know, obviously you need to love mathematical reasoning, but it's a big tent and where many, many different people can have very good roles. I mean, if you have an if you have a taste for uh, say economics or for uh, fairness and public policy or for biology and so on, you can be a very successful algorithms person who has a meaningful impact on these. And also I think that uh, people don't recognize the, uh, the role of luck enough. And I f certainly feel I've been fortunate. I mean, for instance, even to have, let's say mathematical aptitude, which, which many of us, you know, uh, required to do theoretical computer science, you probably had to get at least some of it genetically, right? Which we did nothing about, right? So I feel that, um, uh, you know, the best thing we can bring is attitude and hard work to the table. Uh, talent is necessary, but not, you know, not outstanding talent. If you have outstanding talent, that's wonderful. Please use it. But I think the world and, you know, say computer science, academia, the tech industry, are all really big tents where a whole range of, people with the right attitude and the willingness to put an effort and to get help from others and mentor people below you, so to speak, you know, can all prosper basically, right? So um, yeah, I feel that I've been very fortunate in being supported by so many people. I wish the same fortune for everybody, but with or without fortune, I think that with, uh, with attitude and, and um, hard work, we can go a long way for most of us. Yeah, yeah actually, this is some statement that I have mentioned. I think it was some, from some book that I was reading some time ago. And it was, this is, uh, I don't remember the author of the book, but I think the concept was that, I mean, every person they have, there are like 30 talents and every person has like maybe five or six of them. That's like the best of them. And the main issue is that the case that, I mean, you don't have a talent or not, is not the case. That which of these five that you have it? I mean, something, for example, the people actually may enjoy helping the other people. I mean, they may spend their time for that. And they become I mean, very well-known people that we know that these are like the great people that they started, like Martin Luther King or others, essentially. That just helping the people, or if you, I mean, believe like some of the religion, I'm saying these are the people that, I mean, you don't say like a smartest in just contact, talking with the people, convince them to do good things, essentially. That's already big talent. I mean, not everyone has such a thing. But, and again, these five things you need to find, but all of them, in all cases, I think the hard work, if you don't have the hard work, you never go anywhere. I think that's the part that is the must. And hard work, even in the areas maybe your talent is not the best, you can easily actually surpass some other person, overtake some person just because of the hard work. I have seen it. It is like, it is. I think it is not some kind of a, a, like running things, like 100 things. It is a, for 100 meters. It is running, I don't know, maybe a few days. There are such kind of things even beyond the, the marathon thing that they, you will uh, run for a few days. I think here you need to, somehow run the whole life. And uh, that is, uh, I think, something that is uh, important for the people to consider it and to find these five things. So is there anything you want to add about any other parts? Um, um, just, just to say thanks to many, many people, basically. That's the main thing I'd like. First of all, thank you, Mohammed, for hosting this. Sure. You've really thank been putting you. a lot of time and effort into these and totally your own initiative. Um, you know, but just, uh, you know, you know, when I, I feel, uh, you know, I feel incredibly fortunate to also, you know, have been part of computer science at a time when CompSci has been growing and I look forward to the future and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, feel very grateful. And I, what I hope, what primarily motivates me at this point is what I'm contributing to, to society through what I'm best at, basically. We can all do stuff to to help people in various ways, but we may not be the best people suited for that because some of those may have much more natural talent. Can I identify what I'm good at, what motivates me the most, and 
align that with what may be societally most um, beneficial. And we talked about some of those and uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to other ideas as well in these. And that's what motivates me the most. And uh, yeah, I think I'll end with that, but uh, thank you very much again, Mohan. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, I mean, for being here. I think as we discussed at the early on, I mean, this is not the best time. I think it was good to have that one because I want to say some of my feelings, essentially, in, uh, things about I mean, this all this crazy thing that happens in Iran about I mean, Massa I mean, and others that have been killed. And I can say as like a father, uh, or like I can be brother or sister of any of these guys that is killed and how. Uh, harsh or how bad would be for me to have such a feelings. I hope that this stops and we hear actually good news instead of this bad news from Iran. We have seen um, some of this good news before, like the time that, for example, uh, Professor Mizakhani actually got the <laughs> Fields Medal or lots of other things. We hope that actually see more news from every aspect uh, there. And again, condolences to the, I mean, the family and all these people have been killed. Uh, thanks everyone, and hopefully, I mean, we will um, continue with the other people. And again, thanks, uh, Arvind. I think it was great to have you, and I think always I enjoyed your uh, great uh, intuition and uh, vision about some of these problems. Uh, thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye.